Hello, everyone. Vijay sir, kindly allow us to start the inaugural session. Very good morning to all. Dr. Anil Kumar, kindly start. If the okay. Vice Chancellor has joined, then kindly start. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Great morning to every one of you. My name is Dr. Pius Vavile, and it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University, ICAR, IGFRI, and organizing committee of this webinar. We are delighted to have you with us to participate and share in this program. The theme of this today webinar is Revolution in Neurotechnology for Transforming Agriculture, Food, Nutrition, and Health. This will bridge nanoscience and technology with other sciences. We will mainly focus on the application of nanotechnology in different fields, fields including agriculture and health. Before we get started, I invite Dr. Jamulkar, Associate Professor and Head, Department of Plant Pathology, RLBCU Chasi, and he is also serving as Organizing Secretary of this National Webinar for welcome address and brief background about the university. Welcome, you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Piyush. Uh, good morning, Galaxy of Students, Teachers, and Scientists. Since I'm extremely privileged to welcome Chief Guest of inaugural, inaugural session of webinar, a great scientist for excellence, Deputy Director General, Dr. Tilan Raj Sharma, sir. Welcome, sir. And our beloved Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar. Uh, I also honored to welcome deans, directors, eminent speakers, students, teachers, scientists from throughout the country. This is two days webinar on nano size big impact nano revolution for transforming agriculture, food, nutrition, and health. On this glorious day, we are assembled here to wait to listen to the, uh, the deliberation of eminent speakers on different facets of nanotechnology. About Jhansi, Jhansi is nestled in between Betwa and Pahujriya, the historic city of Jhansi. It's synonymous with the courageous queen, Rani Lakshmi Bai, to whom we all know since our childhood by reciting the poem of Subhadra Kumari Chauhan. Tamak uthi san sattavan mein vaha talwar purani thi, gundele har bolo ke muh se hamne sili kahane thi, khub ladi mardani vah to jhansi wali vah. With the name of this brave queen of jhansi, our university, Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University, established with the Parliament Act of 2014 and got the status of Institute of National Importance. It would have been our immense pleasure to welcome you all in person. But due to traces of COVID-19 in various parts of the country, we organized this webinar as online. To make, your, make you feel your presence in our university, I request Dr. Tanush Mishra to play a five minutes walkthrough uh, of our university. Dr. Tanush, please. Yes, sir. रानी लक्ष्मीबाई केंद्रीय कृषि विश्वविद्यालय की स्थापना वर्ष 2014 में संसद द्वारा पारित अधिनियम के अंतर्गत राष्ट्रीय महत्व के संस्था के रूप में विरांगना रानी लक्ष्मीबाई के नाम से प्रसिद्ध झांसी में हुई विश्वविद्यालय लगभग 300 एकड़ के क्षेत्र में विस्तारित है ये विश्वविद्यालय न केवल बुंदेलखंड अपितु देश के विभिन्न राज्यों के विद्यार्थियों को गुणवत्ता युक्त कृषि शिक्षा अनुसंधान व किसानों को तकनीकी प्रशिक्षण प्रदान करने के लिए प्रतिबद्ध है साथ ही साथ यहाँ उन्नत बीज भी उपलब्ध हो रहा है इसके साथ ही पशु चिकित्सा एवं मत्स्य महाविद्यालय की स्थापना भी इसी विश्वविद्यालय के अंतर्गत दतिया में की जा रही है दलहनी एवं तिलहनी फसलों के अनुसंधान का ये विशिष्ट केंद्र है और यहाँ दक्षता युक्त शिक्षा भी दी जा रही है इस विश्वविद्यालय के दो नवनिर्मित शैक्षणिक एवं प्रशासनिक भवनों का निर्माण कार्य नवंबर 2017 से प्रारंभ होकर लगभग दो वर्षों की अवधि में ही एन द्वारा पूर्ण कर लिया गया शैक्षणिक भवन का कुल क्षेत्रफल लगभग 17,500 वर्ग मीटर है जिसमें 19 स्मार्ट क्लासरूम सहित विद्यार्थियों के लिए तेईस शोध प्रयोगशालाएं भी उपलब्ध है इसके साथ ही ये भवन सर्व सुविधा युक्त बहु उद्देश्य हॉल एवं सेमिनार हॉल से सुसज्जित है प्रशासनिक भवन लगभग 5000 वर्ग मीटर क्षेत्र में निर्मित है जिसमें समिति कक्ष एवं बोर्ड रूम जैसी सभी महत्वपूर्ण सुविधाएं उपलब्ध हैं। विश्वविद्यालय में कुलपति कुल सचिव निदेशक 
अधिष्ठाता के साथ साथ लगभग चौदह राज्यों के उत्कृष्ट शिक्षक निरंतर अपनी सेवाएं दे रहे हैं इन भवनों में ऊर्जा दक्षता के सभी मानकों को समाहित किया गया है जिसमें सौर ऊर्जा पैनल एल लाइट वर्षा जल संचयन तकनीकी एवं प्राकृतिक संसाधनों का प्रयोग किया गया है जो इस विश्वविद्यालय को प्राकृतिक स्वरूप देते हैं माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के कुशल नेतृत्व में जारी नई शिक्षा नीति से कृषि शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में भी युवाओं का कौशल विकास होगा और स्वरोजगार के अनेकानेक अवसर प्राप्त होंगे आज इस विशिष्ट विश्वविद्यालय को माननीय प्रधानमंत्री राष्ट्र को समर्पित कर रहे हैं जिससे हम सभी गौरवान्वित अनुभव कर रहे हैं डॉक्टर जामोलकर काइंडली अनम्यूट काइंडली अनम्यूट थैंक यू डॉक्टर तनुज लेट एस बिगेन टूडेज ऑस्पिशियस इवेंट विद द प्रेज ऑफ मोस्ट मर्सीफुल एंड मोस्ट बेनोलेंट गॉडेज सरस्वती with sir by saraswati vandana and deep prajwal i request uh, for lighting in our land for this session i would like to call upon our honorable uh, vice chancellor sir and chief guest and other dignitaries to join the lighting of the land tanush yes sir thank you dr prasan jambalkar our most distinguished chief guest dr t r sharma deputy director general crop sciences indian council of agriculture research new delhi former executive director dvt navi mohali and former director n r c p v new delhi you being one of the renowned biotechnologists of the country we all colleagues feel delighted on your accomplishment for serving this great nation we feel honored by your gracious presence today in this national webinar sir honorable vice chancellor dr arvind kumar who is the founder vice chancellor and architect of third 
Central Agriculture University and brought first institute of national importance at Jhansi as Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University. And Jhansi is considered as the heart of Central India and it is also land of fiery queen of Jhansi. The university has magnificent building and infrastructure for imparting quality agriculture education as you have already seen through walk through how a magnificent building we have in our university the most important our learned speaker in this webinar so kindly mute kindly kindly unmute dr anil kumar ji okay the most important our learned speaker in this webinar dr j r kanwar aims bhopal dr ramesh Australia, Gujarat, IFCO Gujarat, Dr. M. G. S. J. B. G. B. Pant University of Agriculture and Technology, Pannagar, Dr. Vinod Saharan, uh, Maharana Pratap University of Agriculture and Technology, Udaipur, Dr. P. S. Vijay Kumar, INST, Mohali, Dr. Asuk Kumar Nadda, Solan, myself beside curious participant from more than 20 different states of the country, and mostly they are scientists, faculty member, and student from universities and ICR institution. Our colleague from neighboring institution, Director Ajay Farai, Dr. Amresh Chandra, who is one of the co-organizing partner of this national webinar, and Director Kafri, Dr. Aruna Chalam, Dr. Prasan Jambulkar, organizing secretary, members of organizing team, Dr. Manit Rana, Pius Babele, Dr. Avishek Kumar, Dr. Tanuj Misra, and Dr. Salender Kumar, our colleagues, the all deans director, faculty member, scientist of RLBCU, teaching associate, non-teaching and staff and employee. A very good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you in this national webinar on nano size, big impact, nano revolution for transforming agriculture, food, nutrition and health. And this year we are celebrating 75 years of independence as Ajadi Kamrat Mahusa. In this webinar, in this important year of India's Diamond Jubilee of Independence, we are organizing two days national webinar on this most emerging, challenging and exciting area of nanotechnology, having enormous application in every walk of life, be it agriculture, be it medical, be it veterinary, be it engineering, be it food and nutrition and other industrial sector. Today we have with us a very distinguished scientist of par excellence, able administrator, and policy maker, Professor T.R. Sarma Sahab, and other learned speaker. Sir, it is our wish to invite you in our university physically, but due to coronavirus pandemic threat, we could not do so and invited you in physical, invited you to interact with our stakeholder through this digital platform. Just now to tell about the uh, background of this webinar, as we know that Indian agriculture passing through various revolution, green, white, blue, and now brown revolution has made appreciable achievement in terms of production, productivity, availability of the food grain, horticulture produce, milk, meat, and fish. It has been possible through technological intervention and critical role played by Indian farming and scientific community. However, the issues related to quality in terms of nutrient accumulation and resource use efficiency, which are affecting human health and environmental sustainability are yet to be addressed. This is equally true when uh, human health is having also prime importance on this earth in every action delivered by the mankind. Nutritional well-being is a sustainable force for health, development and maximization of the human genetic potential. The nutritional status of community has therefore been regarded as important indicator of national de development. And malnutrition is major challenge worldwide, especially in developing countries. World Health Organization has identified four major malnutrition crippling globally, iron, iodine, vitamin A, zinc, beside protein energy malnutrition. And burgeoning population and deterioration of the nutritive value of available food products are the major challenge to ensure nutritive and safer food supply to the world population. For addressing such 
deep rooted problems dietary quality should be seriously taken into consideration the one health concept that is being initiated to attain optimum health for people animal and our environment through collaborative efforts of the multiple discipline including frontier sciences and technology nanotechnology has the potential to improve nutritional value of the food feed and meal the method and strategies for nano agronomic augmentation and biofortification will further boost our efforts towards the productivity of agri hearty forestry plants without genetic modification and hence will have wider acceptability among regulatory agency as well as consumers so nanotechnology is helping to considerably improve even revolutionize almost every field of science nanomaterials and particles having their size in 1 to 100 nanometer range at least in one dimension and through the word nanotechnology though the word nanotechnology is new the phenomena of nanotechnology is old and was used by ancient indians like rishi muni used to prepare nano size metal polymers and nano form of the carbons for advancing metallurgical cosmetic and even many medicinal and ayurvedic products are having the basis of nanotechnology good health can only be achieved by nutritionally balanced and health food man relies on three important source of the food from plant from fish from animal which revolutionized the whole agriculture namely tricolor uh, re revolution like green revolution blue revolution and white revolution during the phase of these revolution the main focus was given to increase the production and productivity of the crop fish and animal however the quality in terms of energy and nutrient balance in their produce has not been given due attention as a result the produce obtained from these sources and consumed by the human being suffered from severe threat of imbalanced nutrition and thus increasing the onset of several diseases risk associated with nutritional penalty nanoparticles may act as a novel vehicle for nutrient delivery and serving as a tool for a tool to enable further elucidation of nutrient nutrient metabolism and physiology in both plant and animal the these delivery by cycles and nano minerals or other nano forms in crop based feed additive can pass through the intestinal wall into the body cell more quickly than ordinary minerals with larger particle size and thus improving the uh, by availability the livestock poultry birds and fishes fed upon the ingenious nano nutrients will pass on these minerals nutrient to the next level of consumers that is human being which in turn will provide better nourishment to the consumers for healthier living on planet fortunately nanotechnology came into picture for providing the an opportunity to enrich our food through integrated nutrient management and several other intervention in this webinar deliberation will be made to discuss how nanotechnology intervention will be helpful to supply the healthy food that is grain fish and animal and to augment the nutritional profile what are the role of nanoparticles in fertilizer effect of nanoparticles on food chain biofortification and nutrient enrichment by a nanoparticles in augmenting agriculture and animal production system beside nanotechnology nan beside nano medicine and nanotechnology for base to belt for industrial revolution and environmental sustainability the application of nanotechnology uh, to the agriculture and food industry was first addressed by the united state department of agriculture and the prediction is that nanotechnology will transform the entire food industry changing the way food is produced processed packaged transported and consumed and nanotechnology has potential to reduce the cost of agriculture production by enhancing the input use efficiency nanotechnology also have enormous potential to boost research efforts in basic life agricultural medical and veterinary science it is a cutting edge of multidisciplinary field and provides a detailed road map to the challenge ahead nanotechnology also offer greatly to improve the efficiency in almost every 
facet of life. A key understanding of nanotechnology is that it offers not just better product, but a vastly improved means of production. And it also revolutionized the healthcare, textile, material, information, and communication technology and energy sector as well. The main objective of this webinar is to gather expert from academia or different institution on a common platform to discuss the advancement in the field of nanotechnology and their application in different interdisciplinary field. Other than the, this, another main objective of this webinar is to design for, uh, uh, for the career development of participant and wedding science scholar in the field of nanoscience and technology. This national webinar befitting the broad goal of our university and vision of Honorable Vice Chancellor to attain academic excellence and bridging the dis uh, distances between academic institution of national and global arena to develop RLBCL as agriculture hub of the imminence in this region. This way it can provide the wider awareness about the importance of such frontier area of nanotechnology. Sir, I am happy to share with you that uh, with, uh, along with the IGFRI, our university has submitted a joint research proposal on scientific rationalization and use of indigenous cow-based byproduct in the production of nano-agri input for the promotion of organic farming and sustainable development to this uh, de science, Department of Science and Technology. And it is a basically uh, inter-ministerial uh, program which we have submitted and we are anticipating the funding of this proposal, then certainly IGFRI, CAFRI, and RLBCU are able to make dent in this particular area of importance. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you very much, sir, for updating all of us about the scope and importance of this national webinar. As you mentioned several times, that nanotechnology is involved in all facets of life and it is also. Uh, mixed with different uh, uh, discipline of science. There is a need to develop this science uh, for further development of agriculture and health. Now we are moving ahead for the guest lecture. Before that, I invite Dr. Manit Rana, uh, ICR IGFRI, to present brief by data of our eminent chief guest, Dr. T.R. Sarma, Deputy Director General of Science, ICR Dr. Rana, please. Very good morning, all of you. Our most distinguished, our most distinguished chief guest, Dr. T. R. Sharma, Deputy Director General, Crop Science, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, New Delhi, being one of the renowned plant biologists and biotechnologists of Dr. Sharma's research has been focusing the field of genomics and plant disease resistance, and has been worked on the crop improvement of life. He was a former executive director, DBT Nabi Mohali. Executive Officer of DBT KAB Mohali and former Director NRCPB New Delhi. He earned his BSc in Agriculture in 1985, MSc in 1987, and PhD in 1990 from College of Agriculture of Chaudhary Sarvan Kumar, Himachal Pradesh, Krishi Vishwavidyale, Palampur, Himachal Pradesh. Thereafter, he moved to University of Alberta, Canada for his postdoctoral studies from 1994 to 1996 as a research associate of the Department of Biotech. To his accolades, he was recipient of many awards in his scientific career, such as Young Scientist Award of the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences in 1998, National Bioscience Award for Career Development, one of the highest Indian science awards in 2007. Besides this, Dr. Sharma was elected as a fellow of all the National Academies of India. He received the J.C. Post National Fellowship of Sir BSD in 2013. He has published more than 200 publications in various international and national journals been more than 12,000 citations. Now I welcome today's Chief Guest, Dr. T. R. Sharma, for his guest lecture. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Manit. Good morning to all. Good morning to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Arvind Kumar and Deans. First of all, I would like to Thank organizers for inviting me for this particular symposium. I'm really honored that Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Arvind Kumar 
has thought of inviting me on the, at this occasion so that I can interact with different scientists from different parts of the country. At this occasion, I can see many old colleagues and functionaries of universities, Dr. Arvind Kumar, Director of Education, Dr. S.K. Chaturvedi, Dean Agriculture, Dr. A.R. Sharma, Director of Research, Dr. Amrish Chandra, Director IGFRI, Dr. Prashant, Dr. Manit, distinguished colleagues, participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Arvind Kumar, the Vice Chancellor of this very prestigious Central University, Rani Lakshmi Vai Central Agriculture University, for developing such a beautiful campus. It is indeed a world-class campus, which I can visualize from the movie. And I wish to visit personally at this particular campus. And I would like to convey my best wishes to Dr. Arvind Kumar and his staff. And also would suggest that this beautiful campus now need to fill these labs and buildings, office, etc., with high quality human resource. I'm sure that with passage of time, this university will get more academic staff and also students from different parts of the world. And organizing such a webinar, as a national webinar on nanoscience big impact, nano revolution for transforming agriculture, food, nutrition, and health by Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University and Indian Grassland and Fodder Research Institute jointly will definitely go in a long way in spreading the message to the masses that we have a campus at Chansi, which imparts high quality education and capable of doing cutting edge science in various sphere of spheres of biological science. Well, friends, we know that India has only 2% of the world's land and 4% of fresh water, but it support 16% of the world's population and 10% of the cattle. With such a limited resources, starting from food scarcity to self sufficiency and now in food surplus, I would like to share a few figures here that our total food grain production has increased up to four times from the day of independence, which was 74.2 metric tons in 1947 and now has reached to 304 metric tons, which itself tells us that it happened due to the visionaries like Professor M.S. M. Swaminathan, who got World Food Prize in 1987, and also Dr. Borlaug, who was the person behind this whole story of green revolution for bringing dwarfing gene in wheat and transferring that wheat to Asian countries. And finally, he got Nobel Prize in 1970. So because of these, the vision of our scientific community and leaders in the past, we have achieved self sufficiency in food grain production such as rice, wheat, maize, and also in pulses. Very interesting figures which we got now, that in 2014, the pulses production was only 10 metric ton, which has reached to 24 metric ton in 2021. 20, 20, 20, it was all because of the 
hard work of scientific community and policy support from the government side and also very strong seed system in the country that we could achieve self sufficiency in these crops however in oil seed crops we have yet to achieve self sufficiency we import more than 70000 rupees of oil seed edible oils in the country and we need to bridge that gap and i'm sure that the university's infrastructure and scientific and power as told by dr anil kumar which is very important for pulses and oil seed crops in the country and with the help of university infrastructure and scientific community we will try to we will try to start some programs in oil seeds and pulses at the university level in spite of the fact that we have achieved self sufficiency in agriculture but still we know that our population is increasing with very fast growth we are now 1.35 billion people and to feel this 1.53 billion people which is expected to rise up to 1.5 billion in 2030 we need to have a jump in our agriculture production and our agriculture production has very clearly shown during the covid-19 situation that in spite of the fact that everybody is suffering from the the covid-19 pandemic but still our country and our policy makers honorable vice chair in the uh, under the guidance of honorable vice chancellor uh, this uh, prime ministers we could feed 80 crore people free of cost during the past more than one and a half years it's a major achievement of the farmers and agricultural scientific community that in spite of the fact that all other sectors were having declined growth the agriculture sector could rise to the occasion and we could feed these hungry people and we know that there are many problems of global climate change and decrease in soil fertility macro and micro nutrient deficiency overuse of chemical fertilizer and pesticides and heavy matter presence in soil to fill those gaps the role of nanotechnology is very very important and it provides immense potentials and opportunities to fill these gaps if we use this technology technology intelligently it contributes to sustainable agriculture by enhancing crop production and restoring the soil fertility and quality the nanotechnology deals with developing materials devices and structures possessing at least one dimension size from 1 to 100 nanometers and manipulate the matter on an atomic or molecular scale as i discussed and dr anil also told that nanotechnology has numerous potential application applications which includes their use in agriculture biosecurity biosafety information technology nano biosensors transportation and environmental improvement it's applied in various aspects of agriculture for particularly for the delivery of nano pesticides slow and controlled release of nano particles containing biofertilizers transport of genetic materials for crop improvement and application of nano biosensors for rapid detection of phytopathogen and other biotic and abiotic stresses various strategies devised for sustainable farming under agriculture nano biotechnology are controlled green synthesis of nano particles number 2 understanding of nano particles produced by root endophytes and mycorrhizal fungi number 
interaction of nanoparticles with plant systems such as transport, mechanism of nanoparticles inside the plant body, and for critical evaluation of negative side effects of nanoparticles on different environmental conditions and also on human being. And then finally, development of portable and users friendly nano sensors for rapid analysis of soil, plants, water, and pesticides. We know that nanotechnology has been identified as essential in fulfilling many of the sustainable development goals proposed by the United Nations and solving many of the foresight challenges faced by human, human beings. And these challenges include meeting global energy needs with clean solution, providing abundant clean water globally, increasing the health and longevity of human life, maximizing the production of agriculture and input use efficiency, making powerful information technology available everywhere, and then enabling the development of space. Dear friends, we know that India has embarked upon this particular technology. And we have many successful examples from various institutions, those who are working on various aspects of nanotechnologies. And one of the classical examples has been cited by, cited by Dr. Anil Kumar, the Ayurvedic use of medicinal plants and various formulations, metal formulations which were developed by our ancestors. So even homeopathic medicines, these are also working on the same principles. Although we have used these technologies during the past many areas, but in agriculture, its use is limited to only few areas, particularly development of nanoparticle fertilizer and nanopesticides. And we know that nanofertilizers have already been developed and released in the country. It's really a matter of great pride, and I'm really very much impressed with the discussion of Professor Neil Kumar, who is organizing this webinar about the importance and scope of such green technologies, negative food nutrition and health sector. And Professor Anil Kumar has developed few of green technologies and field filed patent for its wide use, such as green synthesis on nan minerals, nanoparticles, using cow-based products. Nano iron booster technology for curtailing the iron deficiency, anemia, and this technology has been awarded at national level Krishi Shiksha Samman under Mahindra Smriti Awards. I would like to congratulate Dr. Kumar and his team for such a coveted award. And the, the, his work is, and the work at the Rani Lakshmi Bai University, Central University is going to take up various projects in this particular sectors. And I'm sure that under the able leadership of the, the university will achieve greater heights in this particular area. I would like to say here that there should be a proper interaction with, between the technological developers, particularly nanotechnology and biotechnology, and also with agricultural scientists. So it cannot be used in isolation. The nanotechnologists cannot work in isolation. We need to integrate this technology. It's a sort of tool which can be integrated with crop improvement and crop production technologies, and also identification of pests and diseases by using nanosensors, different types of diagnostic kits. But while you study all these things, we find certain gaps which needs to be fulfilled by the scientific community. And the number one and foremost gap in the this particular technology is number one, development of specific hybrid carriers for delivering active agents, including nutrients, 
pesticides and fertilizers in order to maximize their efficiency following the principles of green chemistry and environmental sustainability. We know that these carriers are available to supply or deliver independently either fertilizers or pesticides for the plant growth and nutrient management. However, if we develop a harvest hybrid carrier which can take up these three different commodities and very important nutrients to the plant system, that would be a, a boon to the technology users. Number two, we should design the processes which can be easily upscaled at industrial level. That is the major lacuna which we can see here in this particular technology that we develop under lab conditions, various types of technologies, nanotechnologies. When we talk about scale up, there are only limited examples. Therefore, collaboration between industry and academia is very, very important so that we can make this technology available to the farming community. Number three, comparisons of effects of nano formulations, nano systems with existing commercial products in order to demonstrate real practical advantages. So we should show the impact of this particular technology in comparison to the existing technologies or fertilizers applications or pesticide applications. And we should try to do something different, which can be demonstrated to the general public and to the policy makers. Fourth gap, which I would like to share, share here is acquisition of knowledge and developments of methods for risk and life assessment of nanomaterials, nanoparticles, and nanofertilizers. There are very limited reports about the phytotoxic effect of these materials on non-targeted or targeted organisms other than plants, soil microbiota, and, and bees, honeybees. So studies on these non-targeted organisms by using various well-established methods for biosafety and biosecurity of these particles is very, very important. I would suggest that the institute and universities should work in this direction so that we can fill this gap. The fourth gap which I could see in the literature is advances in the regulation about the use of nanomaterials. We need a particular regulatory system in the country for the release of these nanomaterials in the environment so that there should not be possible impact on human beings. And, and, and I'm sure that the policy advocacy should be and development of various guidelines for use and application of nanomaterial should be an integral part of uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai Central University. And I'm sure that under the able guidance and leadership of Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Arvind Kumar, and the team led by Dr. Anil, to definitely think on these directions and provide various platform to the students and young scientists to work on these new technologies. At this occasion, I would like to congratulate Dr. Arvind Kaur, Vice Chancellor of the University for timely organization of such national webinar on frontier science and technology at the Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University, Chansi which was recently inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister Shri Bodhi ji. And uh, just now we saw a beautiful video on, uh, about the campus of this university, a really fascinating campus. I'm sure that those who have not seen it, including myself, will definitely would like to see this mega infrastructure and also would like to see that this university should definitely grow in future to attract good human resource in this area. And I would also like to congratulate director of the Indian Grassland and Fodder Research Institute, Jansi, Dr. Amrish Chandra, for jointly organizing this program with university. 
I always advocate that either university or institute cannot work in isolation. We should work together. And we have more than 80 scientists at the university institute. And, and I'm told that we have memorandum of understanding with the university. Even there is no memorandum of understanding. I would suggest that the director and vice chancellor should sit together and, and identify areas of mutual interest which can be uh, studied by scientists of both the institutions and scientists of IGFRI should also be involved in teaching and they should be made guide for this particular PhD and MSc program. I would also like to congratulate Professor Anil Kumar for choosing such an important topic uh, for the national webinar. Particularly the topic of uh, this particular webinar is very, very catchy. And that's how Dr. Anil Kumar works. Nano size, big impact. That itself tells that uh, there is a lot of thought which has gone in selecting this particular top topic for this particular conference. So I would like to wish all the success for the organization of national webinar on nano size, big impact, nano revolution for transforming agriculture, food, nutrition, and health. And thank you very much for giving me opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you all. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Namaskar. Thanks, sir, for your valuable remarks and sharing the vision of our past scientific community, in which we have achieved such sufficiency. Looking at the population explosion and current climatic challenges, we will need to have jump even in our agricultural production. Sir, summarize the importance of nanotechnology on global, uh, global energy demand, health and longevity of human life, maximizing the agriculture production and nutrient, nutrition, nutrient use efficiency. Sir, also mentioned the future nanotechnology research should also focus on mechanism of nanotoxicology. Sir, thanks for sharing your vision for the betterment of Indian agriculture using nanotechnological interventions. Uh, now I request Dr. Arvind Kumar, the Honorable Vice Chancellor RLBC Hansi, to felicitate Dr. T. R. Sharma, sir. Uh, sir, please accept this from RLBC and IGF. Token of uh, love from our side. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Ar Ar Arvind Kumar, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for his presidential address. Good morning to everyone. Let me at the outset uh, congratulate and thank our Honorable Deputy Director General, Prof. Francis, Dr. T. R. Sarmaji, for guiding us and also providing valuable input on this very important and I would say a emerging topic. I am thankful to him that he has told about the working of these institutes and grateful for his kind words. And I am happy to say that our honorable DG, Dr. P. Mahapatra, and also our Chancellor, Dr. Punjab Singh, they are very much in tune whatsoever you have said. And in fact, our Secretary Dear and DG ICR had himself reviewed the progress as well as the liaison between the three institutions. And uh, we are consistently having through a coordination committee headed by Dr. Punjab Singh Ji, what are the new areas where we should work together. And I'm happy to say that the faculty from these neighboring institutions are involved in teaching, not only involved in teaching, but also in formulating different academic activities and also very research programs. And whenever there is some policy issues or decision, we always involve the directors and many times the head of division of these two institutes. So, sir, uh, we are taking due care with your blessings and uh, we have the blessings of ICR, each and every division and department. They are all helping us 
in developing the research expertise, in developing academic activities, and also extension education activities. So we, we are trying to uh, achieve the desired goal which has been set by the Department of Agricultural Research and Education. And because of its uh, you know, location in Bundelkhand, there are many expectations from this university. And uh, we, we, we feel that in near future, certainly we shall be able to come to the expectations of uh, Bundelkhand region in particular and national as a whole. Uh, we have with us Dr. Amresh Chandra, the Director of uh, Indian Grassland and Fodder Research Institute, who has always been very positive, very cooperative, and uh, also from time to time actively involved in our academic and research, uh, you know, um, activities and different forums and councils. Dr. Arunachalam from uh, PFRI, Kafri, he has also been since joining, taking a great interest in academics, and he himself is taking course. That's a great thing. So these are, you know, the points through which we can jointly uh, develop ourselves and uh, work for the farming community, work for the nation, and we are rightly going in tune to that particular goal. Dr. Anil Kumar, the Director of Education, who has uh, uh, conceptualized this idea. And uh, when he came to me, I requested him that uh, if uh, our Honorable DDG finds some time, that will be great. And uh, that has come through that uh, he could find some time and gave many good suggestions for future research what we can do and how we can carry forward this important area of nanotechnology. Dr. Jambulkar, who has been coordinating this. And also we have very learned people from different institutions, including IFCO, Dr. Ramesh. And uh, you know that IFCO Nano UV, a few days back, we have seen that in uh, you know many fields through drones, the use of uh, Nano UV spray, certainly reduced not only the cost, but also the cost. So this is... This is, uh, this is being talked about, you know, uh, widely and its application as uh, you know that uh, uh, use of nano area would certainly put a lot of uh, revolution in the field of agriculture. Uh, particularly, you know, in case of sugarcane, when in Western UP, the farmers are using 600 to 700 kg uh, of urea per hectare. So certainly the use of nano urea would not only reduce the cost and quantity, but also efficacy and in terms of productivity. We have the speakers from Pantnagar, Dr. Jaydi, Dr. Nadda from Solon, Dr. Saran from Mujabpur, even from Ajaya Parai, Dr. Manit Prana, Dr. Garbale, who is our Ramanujan fellow, many our colleagues from here, uh, Dr. Abhishek, Tanuj, or uh, uh, Salish, uh, they, they are all calendar, they are all uh, uh, cooperating in organizing this important uh, webinar. And also, we have with us uh, Dean College of uh, Agriculture, Dr. Sushil Chaturvedi, who has always been very uh, helpful and uh, particularly taking a lot of interest in these activities. And also we have Dr. Sarma, A.R. Sarma, uh, who is uh, you know, taking a lot of effort in developing our research form and providing guidance uh, for the research programs in the university. So we have a good team. And uh, I'm sure that uh, our horticulture also, we have been Dr. A.K. Pandey and Director of Extension Education, uh, Dr. S.F. Singh, and everyone they are all, uh, you know, coordinating in such a way so that we can really put our emphasis together, efforts together to make the lives of many farming communities, uh, a, you know, simpler and also providing technology to the different stakeholders. You know that uh, it has been talked about that the nanotechnology is just a uh, uh, word nano. Nano has been explained mainly it's less than one micrometer, or normally in the range of one to 100 nanometers. 
and uh, you know the smallest thing which we can visualize through our eye is 10000 nanometer which is visible by the naked eye and uh, the 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 particular uh, you know techniques or we can say as it has been pointed out by ddg right it's a tool nanotechnology is a tool so it's a manipulation or you can say assembly of uh, the atomic or molecular level or super molecular scale and uh, ultimate objective is to develop the new products new molecules which is in the scale of uh, less than 1 micrometer so this type of the technology uh, this is really helpful in enhancing not only the crop productivity but also in different areas including medicine lot of uses of uh, nanotechnology uh, have been uh, felt Uh, uh you know uh, we know that uh, the country is al- already self sufficient in food grains self sufficient uh, as far as the even the horticulture crops are there we are leading uh, you know always record high production and i congratulate ddg crop science and whole icr that in six crops uh, this time we have got a record product and this is because of the tremendous efforts made by the indian council of agricultural research and the team of scientists and the policy of the government as well as the you know the hard labor done by the farming community so a lot of efforts in science have gone by but this has certainly affected and drained our natural resources and uh, particularly the water the environment impact on the environment the soil the impact on the soil fertility so the depletion of the natural resources by and by we are increasing our food production our horticultural crop production milk production this we need to look how nanotechnology can really help in conservation of our natural resources so nano mission as you know nano mission it is being you know uh, coordinated by uh, department of biotechnology and uh, in 2007 the nano mission a national nano mission was launched and uh, use of nano technology in uh, you know judicious application of fertilizer even the herbicides making them uh, the herbicides more target delivery more uh, target specific delivery of the nano particles nano capsules even detection of many diseases this has uh, really been very helpful and a lot of efforts are needed in the direction for further even for nano processing uh, in case of monitoring the quality of agriculture produce this can be very helpful i was reading somewhere that uh, even the rice uh, bran when we burn this uh, rice bran uh, there is lot of uh, generation of this uh, silica so this uh, nano silica can be again utilized for development and product new product like glasses or concrete material or so so even uh, there are various products which can be brought about uh, i have already talked about nano urea but in also uh, detection of the you know various uh, uh, natural resources through the can allow definitely in precision farming because we need to quantify we need not to have a indiscriminate use as we know that there is indiscriminate use of various chemicals which is impacting our soil health and also the environment so nano sensors can allow precision farming and uh, also the in the delivery system various kind of sensors through which uh, we can have our controlled application guided application and such devices can be helpful for uh, you know uh, managing our natural resources even the biosensors biosensors uh, have a uh, you know great role and lot of research is going on as far as the, the biosensor is concerned now as we can see that uh, the government is uh, paying emphasis in the ethanol production from me and uh, cellulose feed stocks are now regarded as a viable option for biofuel production 
and nanotechnology can also enhance the performance of enzyme. So this way, this can also help in this particular aspect, which is again very important. And uh, the conversion of cellulose from the waste uh, plant parts into ethanol and certain other activities could be talked about. Now, we know that a lot of applications does exist as far as the you know, nanotechnology is concerned. But a lot of many things uh, need to be done uh, uh, in this particular area. There may be the concern of phytotoxicity and reactivity of the nanomaterial in environment, particularly in soil, how it, uh, you know, uh, impact various enzymatic activity, how it, uh, uh, you know, affect the rhizosphere and uh, how ultimately uh, we can have new knowledge in that particular direct direction. So we need to validate all those, uh, you know, uh, areas and uh, provide the solutions to that validation of nano sensors, concern of uh, genotoxic effect of cellular nanomaterials on nano agricultural products, then some regulatory issues. Of course, these guidelines have been developed and prepared. We have also lack of knowledge uh, in the area of nanotechnology. And through these webinars, this is uh, one of the ways through which uh, we can uh, create, uh, you know, uh, new knowledge, create, you know, its application and what may be the impact through various papers. And also the, you know, how important the, you know, some of the rhizobium, rhizobacteria, which I've uh, talked about, how uh, really uh, we can uh, boost up their activity without having adverse impact. So nanotechnology, uh, lot of role have been talked about in bi crop biotechnology in, and particularly in regulation of hormones, particularly the organs and so on. So a lot of advantage are there and uh, in uh, nanotechnology, although as it has been talked about, nano uh, size, but it has got a big impact and big impact on the natural resources, big impact on the environment, big impact uh, on the conversion of various waste materials, and also uh, having, you know, uh, its uh, role in controlling and uh, monitoring the quality of various uh, products, detection, and uh, ultimately uh, in the processing sector, also it can play a very important role. So we need to talk about whether it is nano capsules or nano sensors or nano barcodes or nano emulsions or nano polymers, or uh, we can talk about nano uh, sensors which we have just uh, talked about and the nano fertilizers like uh, nano urea. So all these are the new areas where we need to uh, work a lot and uh, we need to carry out uh, uh, researches in the new area uh, with a view how we can overall improve our natural resources, how we can improve the quality, how we can increase the human health and also in the drug delivery systems and simultaneously the concern how we can reduce the adverse impact if any and how we can eliminate both. So there is a lot of scope in the researchable issues in this particular area. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity. And uh, why, once again, I uh, am grateful to our honorable DDG for being with us. And uh, we would like to see him very soon. And uh, I, I welcome you, sir, uh, to visit this campus and also guide our students. On 10th, our PG students will be on the campus. And it shall be a great opportunity to listen to you to have an interaction with our students and faculty that will further uh, pose a, you know, uh, a new course of inspiration and also will provide a lot of uh, thoughts for future research in this particular area. So thank you very much and thank you all the organizers for uh, organizing this very important webinar and all the speakers who shall be giving their valuable thoughts and wisdom to make this program. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your words with us. You mentioned several uh, key points. Uh, one is nano fertilizers, another is uh, nano mesen. And you also mentioned about the uh, role of nano biosensor in the area of cancer detection and, and several other, other uh, key diagnoses. I thank you again, uh, Vishi, sir. Your words are always motivate us to uh, conduct uh, similar kind of activities in future. Thank you, thank you once again, sir. Now I welcome uh, Dr. Manit Rana uh, for uh, for vote, vote of thanks. One thing I would like to um, inform our honorable DG, DDG that uh, we are also organizing sir a lot of uh, activities. Almost uh, 30, 35 days annually uh, we celebrate. And also under the Atal Javikyan lecture series, we have 17 lectures of very eminent scientists across the country. So this three activities we are continuing for the benefit of the faculty and our students. So these activities, because of the you know corona pandemic, many times the physical presence is not there, but it's still online, we are trying as many webinars, through seminars, interactions we can have. And we also involve our students and all the students. This is just for this purpose. Yeah, I would like to suggest you, sir, thank you very much for the update, that your university is very young. So try to organize a young scientist conference along with the PhD student and invite uh, particularly Ramalinga Swami fellow, inspire faculty for delivering their talk because they are really excellent uh, young scientists which I have seen in the system and they will definitely uh, have some impact on the, on the student's life at your institution. But definitely, I would like to come to your campus. Sure. Very sure, good. Sir. That, that's very good suggestion. Very good suggestion. And we will certainly take up very soon and we will do it. This, okay. is, this is wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Jagatram Nadda, uh, Jagatram Kambar from Hamirpur. He is uh, at present uh, Ames Bhopal. He would like to interact. I think uh, he was asking your number. So, Dr. Dr. Jagatram Kanbar, who is uh, now professor and head uh, Ames Bhopal. I think he is there. Hello, okay. sir. Uh, I'm... Hello, I'm Dr. Jayat Kanbar. Uh, I'm from, also from Himachal, Hamirpur. So, I saw your CV, Dr. T.T. Sharma. You're also from Hamirpur, yeah? Yeah. 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 Ladror. Yeah. I, I, I've yeah. been my matriculation from Karwar. I see. And probably <laughs> we can, we can discuss. Uh, yeah, we can details. chat later. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we can chat later. Thank yeah, you very much true. for interaction. So I'm talking tomorrow yourself? morning. I'm talking tomorrow. I'm Ames of Bal. I serve uh, outside overseas for 26 years in uh, Australia and in uh, Auckland University School of Medicine. So I'm in professor of nanomedicine there from the last uh, 10 years. So my parents are old and I thought this is the time to serve my country back. So we decided to come back to India. So that's the reason. I saw your name, T.P. Sharma. I thought I heard this name. There is another T.R. Sharma from Solon. So he was my senior at that time. He was from agriculture, I think, from vegetable. So I thought I searched a little bit and I asked Dr. Niels, and he said, no, he is also from Himachal. <laughs> <laughs> and we welcome you here in the country and we really need people like you. We, yeah, all, have, we all have gone for doing postdoctoral training and came back. Okay. You, you have rich experience working abroad and I'm sure that the yeah. area which you are working will be definitely benefited from your studying yeah. experience. So yeah, we definitely, talk we, later. We have, yeah, we, we talk later. Thank yeah. you. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Anil, for connecting me with Dr. Kavar. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You share my mobile number with him. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, sure. Honorable yes, sir. dignitaries, distinguished guests, respected Vice Chancellor Dr. Arvind Kumar, Director IGFRA Dr. Ramesh Chandra, Director of Education Dr. Anil Kumar, Dean College of Agriculture Dr. S.K. Chaturvedi, sir, University Librarian Dr. S.S. Kushwaha, organizing team and dear participants. On behalf of RLB CAU and ICR IGFRA Chancellor, I feel immense pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to Dr. T. R. Sharma, Deputy Director General of Crop Sciences, ICR New. I want to express my sincere gratitude to Sir, who has spared his precious time from his busy schedule to grace the occasion 
and enlighten all of us with his innovative ideas on nanotechnology science. His vision for the betterment of Indian agriculture in this webinar. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind presence and source of motivation and inspiration to the scientific fraternity. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, we are starting our keynote lectures, and the first keynote lecture is on nano agriculture for agri food nutrition by Dr. Anil Kumar, Director of Education, RLB CAU, Chance. Before starting, I request Dr. Piyush for giving a brief biodata of Dr. Anil Kumar to our participants. Uh, now, before uh, the presentation, we are breaking for five minutes. Uh, after five minutes, we will start our first keynote lecture. Thank you very much. Now I would like to take leave, sir. Mashka. I have another meeting now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mashka. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. You are mute, sir. Screen, screen, our share, can we? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are enabled. It's enabled now. Huh? Enabled, enabled, sir. Screen share. Okay. Silent, sir. Are you, sir? Go, sir. It's coming, sir. They are visible, sir. No. Hello. Uh, <laughs> 
Welcome again, all of you. So now we are starting our first lecture. So the first lecture is uh, delivered by Dr. Anil Kumar. So the topic of uh, Dr. Anil Kumar's lecture is Nano Agriculture for Agri Food and Nutrition. Uh, before that, I would like to introduce Dr. Anil Kumar to all of you. So Dr. Anil Kumar is an eminent teacher, outstanding educator, and scientist of international review. He joined GB Fund University of Agriculture and Technology as assistant professor in 1993 and served for 25 years in different capacities. After successful completion of two tenures as professor and head department of molecular biology and genetics, he joined as a director of education at the Rani Lakshmi Bai Central Agriculture University, Kansi, in 2018. Dr. Kumar has made outstanding research contributions in the area of genomics for crop improvement, especially in resolving the complexity of agriculture important traits such as the biotic species and mineral nutrition. For the first time, he has identified several DWD network controlling important traits using multi, multi omics approaches. Dr. Kumar has filed 11 patents on synthesis of nano delivery vehicles for facilitation of uptake of fat soluble vitamins, nano curcuminoids for better bioavailability. Dr. Kumar has published more than 215 research papers, both in national and international reviewed review of uh, peer reviewed journals. He also visited several countries and uh, countries. And he has a, a diverse uh, area of interest. Now I welcome you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Pius, for nice word while you introducing me. A very good afternoon to all the participants attending this national webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasant Jambulkar, organizing secretary and member of the organizing team for giving me this opportunity to interact with the esteemed faculty and student who are attending this national webinar on nano size big impact. Now I am going to speak on nano agriculture for agri food nutrition. And in this presentation, I would like to give you the glimpses of the nanotechnology research which has been conducted not only in our lab, but also in other Indian lab, so that you can able to understand how nanotechnology is playing pivotal role in the agriculture, not only for the production of nano agri input, but also simultaneously nano ag agri food system. So as we know very well that uh, Indian agriculture has a uh, moving ahead since independence from food shortage to and import to self-sufficiency and export from subsistence farming to intensive and technology-led cultivation. It also occurred through the green, white, blue, and yellow revolution as we are discussing in the morning. And today India is the front ranking producer of many crops in the world. Now it is further realized during the post-COVID era, when food production has reached highest due to hard work of the farming and scientific community. And if you see the India's position in the world agriculture, you will find either it is first or second, or maybe in few cases, it is third and fourth. If you see the total area of the cultivation over, all over the world, it is seventh. Irrigated area wise, it is first. Population wise, it is second largest population, populous country. Economically active population, that is second. Total cereal production is second. Wheat, rice production, second. 
coarse grain production is fourth total pulse production is first and oil seed it is second and fruit and vegetable it is second and implement tractor that is been used in our country it is third position and milk and the livestock it is stood first position for the production of these commodities now if you see the challenges achievement and challenges then uh, we we are proud to achieve in 2021 all time record production of cereals pulses oil seed cotton and sugar cane that is 308.65 million ton this is 3.7% increase to a new record and there is also appreciable increase in the production of horticulture produce that is 329.86 million ton a rise of 2.93% and also there is a steady rise in milk 6.28% eggs production that is 7.82% meat production 5.15% and fish production that is again increase of 2.1% that is been observed in 2021 in our country but we have to have concern to produce more from less land and water in the scenario of climate change as already pointed out by our ddg crop science that we have only 2% land and 4% of the water and we are feeding 16% of the population and 10% of the cattle so now we have to have another challenge under the situation of global warming and climate change and we have to follow the principle of mlm and this mlm principle is more from less for more that is to be followed in every corner of the agriculture production system now if you, uh, if you see the challenges again we found declining in the activity basically if you see uh, there is a declining in productivity diminishing food production growing population and food security they are still are the pressing concern of the indian agriculture though we are self sufficient but still these concern are very much there because in 2020 to 2050 indian population rise will rise to 1.7 billion while calorie demand to increase by 60% and then there is also problem of rapid urbanization rise of industrial belt soil erosion and climate changes and ultimately all these are causing the declining in per capita availability of the land in 99 1951 to 2050 you will find 90% decline in the per capita availability of the land and ultimately you will see this will this will further enhance uh, this will further create lot of challenges in terms of minus of the pest and diseases depleting natural resources land water and bio, water bodies lack of improved seed variety effective plant nutrient avitic stress and environmental concern so all these concern are still very much there still very much exist and henceforth there is a need of science led technology led development to address all these concern related to sustainability it's not moving Tanuj. Hello, yes, sir. It is not moving. Okay, 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 sir. Ah, now it is moving. Now it is moving. So now you see that uh, agriculture is generally considered as the backbone okay, of the okay, many sir. developing country, including India. And uh, if we have to find out what are the target area, these are the important target area like crop protection, crop nutrition, avitic stress management, quality and nutrition enhancement. so if we want to resolve these problems on agriculture productivity we need to require a smarter way of technological intervention in different in different of these area and ultimately once we are taking technological intervention whether in the form of nanotechnology or wide technology or genomics etc et then we are able to increase in both agriculture and horticulture production and it will also promote other allied sector of the agriculture like livestock dairy poultry and fisheries now if you see in our uh, uh, modern agriculture we are using extensive use of this inorganic fertilizer or inorganic minerals and basically 
ultimately all these inorganic fertilizer or minerals they are increasing the essential micronutrient in the soil conditions but simultaneously excessive use of these inorganic minerals and fertilizer they are causing the sedimentation that led to affect the soil and soil bi biota as in the morning our vice chancellor is saying that while we are using excessive use of the fertilizer ultimately they are affecting the soil quality soil fertility and also the presence of the cell microbiome in the soil condition and ultimately the rhizosphere changes are very much observed under the modern cultivation of agriculture and they are also basically destabilizing the food product chain and ultimate and also they are generating destructive free radical and uh, intake of which is very very harmful and under these conditions when this rhizosphere biology is altering when rhizosphere is altering then we have to require solution in terms of the nanotechnology that is considered to be boon in this direction now there is a shift in paradigm from the first green revolution that is based on mainly excessive use of the chemical and organic fertilizer high yielding seed variety use of pesticide irrigation and improved agriculture practices however we are expecting from first green revolution to to the next ever green revolution and ultimately that will enhance the productivity and also they are enhance the delivery of the all nutrient required for the crop production and henceforth nano nutrient is considered to be very very pertinent for enhancing the productivity and therefore if we are using nano nutrient then we have to know what they are ultimately doing they are basically reducing the harmful and negative impact of the environment and human health and they are increasing the agriculture input use efficiency this is a very very important because you know i think uh, while we are using nano organic fertilizer most of these fertilizer goes to waste whether they are bio leaching whether they are volatilizing and maybe other sedimentation effect and henceforth this while we are using nano nutrient they are increasing the input use efficiency simultaneously we are using the enhanced property exhibited by nano sized particle and material they have widespread application and uh, simultaneously if you compare the nano nutrient with the inorganic fertilizer and nutrient you will find that nano nutrient are three time more night nutrient having more nutrient use efficiency and they are 80 to 100 times less requirement to chemical fertilizer and the nutrient they are 10 times more stress tolerant by the crop so basically crop is also tolerating 10 times more of these nano nutrient and they are 30% more nutrient mobilization mobilization was observed in the plant system and uh, simultaneously not only these nano nutrient are enhancing the quality there is a increase in the uh, major nutrient whether iron zinc or maybe other nano nutrient that is accumulated in very higher quantity and simultaneously they are also giving 10 to 50% crop enhancement or crop yield enhancement while we are using these nano nutrient and that's why the theme of this seminar was the nano size big impact funny how it takes little to do so much this is basically the theme of this particular webinar where we have to see how little amount of these nano nutrients they are giving big impact in the agriculture production system anuj i think again it is not moving Uh, yes sir move okay now it is moving so now if we are using nano nutrient we are expecting the next green rainbow revolution and that is basically the use of nano nutrient that led to augmentation of green white blue and yellow revolution and now you see here this uh, nano technology is providing lot of solution because these nano fertilizer they are having slow release of the nutrient and uh, they are providing the nutrient for longer growth span and uh, similarly nano pesticide which we have developed through nanotechnology they are providing targeted delivery of the active molecule so as to avoid negative effect of the non target beneficial organism as we are talking in the morning that uh, we have to look upon the nano safety uh, measures 
where we have to look upon how nanonutrients are affecting other beneficial organisms or not target species. So this is a very, very important because uh, we are uh, giving this uh, targeted delivery of these active molecules only onto the plant system and henceforth non-target beneficial organism will remain intact. Then similarly, slow release of pesticide also been there for longer time span so that crop will remain protected. Then early pathogen detection that has been there. So while we are using nano agrochemicals, they are providing timely release, timely controlled, especially targeted, regulated, responsive, and effective delivery system. So this is the way how nanotechnology is going to play significant role in the agriculture production system. Not moving, I think there is some problem. So basically in 2011, uh, uh, ICR has started a nano mission program and we are also partner in this program and uh, in this the mission statement of this nano agriculture is to infuse principle and concept of nanotechnology in agriculture sciences that enables to achieve science led development of food and nutritional security without harming the environment. So basically this is the statement very important statement it is the need of time that we have to infuse the principle of and concept of nanotechnology for agriculture production system. So in the agriculture, we have wide range of opportunity. That is basically, if you see the nanotechnology application in agriculture, particularly uh, application in soil water remediation, nanotechnology for fertilizer, nanotechnology application for plant disease and diagnostics, gene expression manipulation, because many, many of the uh, gene transfer techniques are based on nano particles then nanotechnology based animal production and livestock feed or cattle feed that is also being developed then nano sensor for grain storages and nanotechnology application for material development so these are the important opportunity that is very much existing for the enhancement of agriculture product product system now nano agriculture basically the basic function we have uh, divided into three one of the most important is synthesis of the nanomaterial or nanoparticles and for that purpose we have to use physical and mechanical methods that is the ball milling have been utilized top down approaches have been used or we have to use the bottom up approach like chemical citrate reduction sol gel method or biological synthesis of nanomaterial utilizing the microbes plant or the animals then we have to characterize these nanomaterials and nanoparticles utilizing various techniques like particle size analyzer that is called zeta potential or zeta size, then scanning electron microscope, atomic force microscopy, transmission electron microscope, Raman spectroscopy, FTIR, XRD, NMR, GCMS, GPT, spray dryer, UV visual spectroscopy. So these are the different uh, high end of the instrumentation that is being utilized for characterization of these nanomaterial. And application they include the development of nano agri input like nano seed nano fertilizer nano herbicide nano pesticide nano fertilizer then nano food system i told you there is very important uh, uh, area where this nanotechnology play pivotal role one is the nano agri input another is the nano food system and nano food system we can prepare nano encapsulation devices smart packaging material barcoding quality control biofortification and then nanotechnology biotechnology where we have to develop the dna chip gene delivery system microarray etc and diagnostics we are having lot of newer method where we have to use colloidal gold particle and biosensor based on quantum dot that is could be developed uh, uh, utilizing the nano uh, principles and these are the approaches which we are talking about that uh, there is a need of interdisciplinary approaches we are not only the biological science but also there is a role of the chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer engineering are very much there. And I told you the top down and bottom up approaches are generally being used for the development of these nanomaterials or nanoparticles. Now nanoparticles, they are typical in the size range of one to 100 nanometer and they can have different shapes and composition. They have, because of uh, their uh, uh, shape, they are having high surface area and high reactivity and this reactivity you can even derivatize these nanoparticle by uh, by certain chemical entity so they become biogenic uh, nanomaterials 
and then they are also showing different physicochemical property if you are comparing their no normal counterpart then they have better penetration into into cell they are very much effective catalyst for plant microbial metabolism so basically they are ultimately triggering ultimately triggering uh, uh, the uh, not only the metabolic pathway simultaneously all cellular signal transduction pathway energy transduction pathway that is been affected by these nanomaterials and they are also increasing both plant and microbial activity they allow one to one interaction between nanoparticle and biomolecules of interest so there is a nanoparticle biomolecule interaction is there and ultimately they are changing the property of the biological system and ultimately they are either enhancing the efficiency of the biological system or maybe declining the efficiency of the biological system that's why we have to work upon extensively to find it out the role of nanoparticles in triggering the biological machinery of whether plant or the animal or the microbial system and these are the different uh, 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 instrumentation which i already talked about they have been utilized for good quality of the nano technology laboratory then uh, i told you that nano technology play a very very significant role in uh, different phases of the revolution whether it is a green revolution to evergreen revolution you will find the role of nano technology for delivery of the fertilizer micronutrient supply insect pest management nano fun fungicide and nano sensor beside you will also find nano herbicide so these are the different application of the nano technology in the field of agriculture and then uh, white revolution you will find the nano nanoparticle they have to be utilized from far to four pathway where you have to see the feed additives they are if developed through nanotechnology in the form of nano nutraceutical encapsulated devices and improving feed conversion ratio by employing the the additives so that you will see that nutrition and health of the animal could be ultimately ensured and that is that is the reason while you are ensuring this uh, food uh, and the health security of the animal ultimately we are ensuring assuring the food quality and uh, in this chain we can also utilize other other nanotechnological application for detection and adult adulteration in the milk because many of the devices the diagnostic devices that has been developed utilizing the nanotechnology principle which can detect the adulteration in the milk then also they can improve the meat meat and egg quality and they are also augmenting the reproduction particularly they could be utilized for cryopreservation semen sorting and nano purification bioimaging transgenic and uh, another very very important part in the animal health security we have to develop the dif different vaccination utilizing the calcium nanophosphate based vaccine delivery system then immunomodulation and systemic and mucosal immunity so ultimately the different kind of these nano devices or nano particles or nano material that could be utilized for the animal productivity and then also it will be utilized for blue revolution particularly for fish production or aquaculture production because you know aquatic resources they have been faced by multiple stresses and these multiple stresses are ultimately affecting the growth and reproductive performance that immunosuppression and disease susceptibility and ultimately in order to manage the fish resources or aquatic resources we have to utilize the new uh, utilized the different management strategy and one of the most important management strategy is nutritional intervention where we have to provide the good aqua food and uh, they are also uh, uh, they could also be able to mitigate the uh, pr problems due to climate change and global warming and salinity tolerance and other toxic with chemical pesticide residue that could also be eliminated utilizing the nanotechnology so in this manner there is a lot of scope of the nanotechnology in the aquaculture production and now thematic area of nanotechnology in agriculture which we have conceptualized in the nano mission program the theme one was the early diagnosis of diseases and nutrient deficiency in crop theme two insect pest management through nano for nano pheromones and nano formulation and theme third enhanced input use efficiency theme four uh, nano food system and smart packing theme five 
the biosafety analysis and policy framework and theme seven, uh, six is the human resource development. So these are the important thematic area that is required if we want to really apply the nanotechnology and agriculture, then we have to go in these thematic area. And one of the first and foremost important in order to develop good quality human resources in, a, in any of the academic institution, the capacity building is a first and foremost important uh, uh, task. And henceforth, uh, we have to work how good quality of the human resources could be generated in the field of nano technology. Then uh, we are expecting delivery while we are initiating such of the thematic area, we have to deliver like diagnostic techniques and kit for early detection of disease based and also hunger sign of nutrient and food contaminants. Then uh, we are also having the nano pheromones and biocontrol agent. And because in the biocontrol agent, if you are making the nano formulation and they can be designed and fabricated, then they can provide better insect waste management practices. Then we have also developed customized nano agri input for enhanced efficiency. This is another very, very important area. Then we can have to encapsulate the functional food like vitamins, minerals, pigments, and bioactive compounds. And you know, many times these uh, 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 iron pills or other uh, vitamin pills you are taking, it is giving the stomach discomfort. So if you are in encapsulating, in the nano uh, emulsion or nano uh, devices, then uh, uh, such kind of the functional food could be easily made bioavailable through the human intestine. And then nano films can be evolved to preserve fresh and processed fruits, vegetable, meat, and fish product. And then another important, while we are initiating such program, then uh, morning we are talking nano safety issue. That is basically required to ensure that product which we are developing through nanotechnology are safe to the end user beside environmental safety. And I always say that there are three important uh, biosafety criteria for, for any of the technology, that is the human health, then biodiversity, and the environment. These are the three. And uh, if technology, any technology developed and evolved, if they are found safe for these three things, that technology is considered to be uh, safe for uh, utilizing by the human population. And then uh, next thing is the uh, that uh, in our laboratory, we have also synthesized many of the nanoparticles like iron, zinc, copper, phosphorus, magnesium, and calcium. And uh, we have filed many of the patents uh, based on their applications. And then uh, such nanoparticles could be used for designing of the phytonutrient mixture for higher yield. Then basically, you know, for every crop, we have to require the different composition of phytonutrient. And if we are using the nanonutrient in these phytonutrient formulation, then their efficacy will be much, much higher. Then we also develop iron booster for nano fortification of wheat. We'll discuss it. Copper guard for disease management, zinc booster for curtailing thera disease. And then also we can able to develop formulation for cattle feed, poultry feed, and fish meat. And these are the um, nanoparticle which we have synthesized. Their size range is also in the range of 40 to 100 or maybe 100 to 200 nanometer. And they are giving different shapes and size. And accordingly, their function also varied. And uh, we also synthesize the nanoparticle using plant extract. And then uh, one of the green synthesis method, we utilize the synthesis of nanoparticle utilizing the cow-based urine and the uh, cow dung had been utilized for development of these nanoparticles. And uh, this is the technology which we are talking, where we are uh, soaking the wheat in presence of very little uh, concentration of the uh, nano iron, that is 25 ppm. And uh, this little concentration, uh, they are increasing the germination capacity. They are triggering the grain iron accumulation in the alluron layer. Alluron layer, the iron accumulates is much, much higher content, much, much higher concentration as compared to in the seed coat and the endosperm. And then I know these uh, nano iron particle basically also promoting the root and shoot length. If you see the, com if you compare the control with the treatment of this uh, iron nano particle using 25 nano, uh, 25 ppm concentration, there is extensive growth, root and shoot growth has been observed. And in the grain, again, 
there is a 25 to 45 percent increase in the iron concentration has been observed while we are harvesting the harvesting the uh, seed after the imbibing the seed and growth in the field conditions and then the uh, zinc nanoparticle also modulate root architecture growth and yield in rice and uh, you see here how extensive uh, growth has been observed and we have selected two variety one is the zinc efficient another is the zinc inefficient variety we are taking that is pd16 and ndr359 respectively and there is remarkable changes has been observed in the root and shoot architecture and you see the uh, 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 picture you will find the profuse rooting profuse uh, soil uh, profuse uh, shooting and also the chromophoric moiety that is also get enhanced so you can observe that biomass of the variety is also increased and yield was also enhanced up to 10 to 15 percent with different modes of the treatment we have given different modes of the treatment like the seed uh, imbibation then seedling uh, seedling applications and also the foliar bio spray that has been utilized and ultimately it was found that these nanoparticles are ultimately influencing the root architecture growth and yield as well as the zinc accumulation in the seed grade and similarly we also observe one of the study of the dr tarapdar and dr ms ralia group they are also finding that uh, nano iron and nano zinc particle they are stimulating the microbial activity by secretion of the important enzyme like phytases uh, phosphatases and phytases they are secreted in much higher concentration so it it can be seen how microbial activity could be enhanced by the treatment of this uh, soil uh, utilizing the nano iron and nano zinc particle then now we also observe that nano zinc reduce the carbon excretion by the root and they also enhance the root area and the length you can see this study has been conducted by dr tarafdar in pearl millet and cluster b in both of the cases there is a decrease in the carbon excretion has been observed simultaneously there is also increase in the area length and diameter of these pearl millet and cluster bean have been observed in presence of nano zinc particle so this is the crop you can see how control uh, behaving and in presence of zinc how nice crop you can see uh, in presence of the nano zinc uh, in the field conditions and then uh, you can also see the effect of nano rock phosphate on plant growth and nodulation it was found that uh, nano phosphorus that is having 57.8 percent efficiency as compared to if you are using single superphosphate that is having 15.1 percent and kh2 po4 that is 29.8 percent and this 640 milligram of nano phosphorus that is equivalent to 80 kg uh, p2o5 so this is the actually you can see how rock phosphate uh, and how the nano uh, phosphate they could be uh, they could be if, if he's, if he's, uh, they, they, they are efficacious as, com as compared to nano rock phosphate. And then uh, this is the effect of nanomaterial on yield and crop under field conditions. And you can find nano phosphorus that is giving tremendous increase in the grain yield that is uh, 650 in the control condition, ordinary phosphorus, and 900 uh, kilogram per hectare that is been observed in presence of uh, mm, nano phosphorus in cluster bean. However, similarly, pearl millet, the increase has been observed to 100, 700, uh, 733, that is 47 point percent increase has been observed in the pearl millet. And this is the nano zinc uh, particle, which are not only enhancing uh, the uh, grain yield and the nutrient accumulation, they are also, also simultaneously uh, influencing the germination rate because uh, the biger could also be enhanced in presence of the nano zinc particle. Then uh, carbon nanotube, they also promote the seed germination. You can see that uh, in the tomato uh, plant, they have uh, very little concentration of na carbon nanotube. They are accelerating the germination percentage. This is also the use of nanonutrient. You can see here that uh, this is a paper published in Nat Nature Biotechnology, where you will find how the small concentration of these, the carbon nanotube, they could be very, very efficacious for the germination of the tomato seedling. Then uh, in, our, also, in our lab, 
we also conducted the experiment where these mineral nanoparticle enhances the secondary metabolite production. So in the synergy of secondary and uh, tertiary agriculture. Now in the in the modern era, we should not rely on the only on to the primary agriculture, but we have to rely on secondary and tertiary agriculture. And in this circumstances, you will find nano mineral nanoparticle. They are enhancing tenfold uh, higher concentration of the accumulation of bidhaniloid A in Vedanifera somnifera, Vedania somnifera. However, while we are using zinc and uh, iron nanoparticle, iron nanoparticle is giving fourfold increase in the Vedaniferin A. So this is the very much high scope of the nanoparticle for enhancing the secondary metabolite production in the medicinal and aromatic plant. And this is a very simple foliar spray uh, application where this content of the these uh, bedanilide and bedaniferin is increased many many fold and then uh, nanotechnology application also having role in plant disease management particularly uh, you can see the development of uh, uh, not only the diagnostics and uh, diagnostic method but simultaneously also the smart treatment delivery system that could we also develop so in the disease diagnosis and screening method we have to see the retrieval uh, nano system for sampling a specific component then in pathogen detection we have to met, have method for near real time pathogen detection and location reporting and then a smart delivery system you can say time controlled especially targeted self and remotely regulated pre-programmed characteristic to avoid biological barrier for successful target. So basically, you can see how these nanotechnology play very, very significant role in uh, uh, not only the diagnosis, but also the treatment of the many important plant diseases, utilizing the nano carbon, nano silver, nano alum aluminum silicate, and nano silver, nano silica silver, and beside the nano copper particles. And this is the uh, where nano silica silver composite have been utilized for controlling the powdery mildew disease. So this is uh, the application you can uh, see how severe disease has been observed uh, of this powdery mildew in the cooker uh, plant. And uh, if you are treating it with the with the nano silica silver composite, and also in our lab we are also looking the impact of the nano copper for curtailing the uh, curtailing the incidence of the many of the important fungal diseases so these are the nano material they could be developed like nano silver particle nano zinc oxide and all these are different uh, shape and sizes and then uh, they have lot of wide application in terms of you can see that the nano zinc or nano iron or nano copper they have been de 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 developed and simultaneously utilized in different crop system and ultimately they are in not only influencing the grain yield but simultaneously they are affecting the seed germination biomass and also the growth biover uh, growth vigor etc so here you can see there is a lot of application has been uh, conducted in uh, in different uh, labs and uh, world over and you find you can find the impact of these nanoparticles in nanotechnology uh, in agriculture for enhancing yield as well as enhancing the nutrient accumulation. So we have developed a innovative farming technology that is called iron booster technology. It is a new process of iron, iron biofortification in wheat through priming of the seed with iron oxide nanoparticle. And you can see that one, one of the major public health problem is anemia, a large percent of the population they are having anemia especially in developing country and there is a high prevalence of anemia that has been reported in adolescent girl women and children and at all stages and india and other developing country they are suffering a lot and you see the being milk is that is considered as a complete food that is also deficient in iron and hence affecting the human health and uh, simultaneously you will also find decline in the soil fertility uh, and ultimately iron deficiency is also prevalent in the food chain crop animal and fishes and they are affecting the human health and this is the method which we have developed very simple method where we are uh, imbibing the wheat seed in presence of the nano iron particle and ultimately we are propagating in the pot condition even in the field condition and ultimately uh, after flowering and seed setting the grain harvest is grain harvesting has been done and in the grain, it was observed 
that iron is mainly localized in the aluron layer and there is i told you 25 to 45% increase in the iron content has been observed if we have taken two contrasting variety of the iron uh, where we found the low accumulating variety is uh, is uh, uh, triggering the iron uh, uh, acquisition pathway as compared to high uh, accumulating variety uh, it it is having very high amount of the uh, trigger in the high uh, uh, high accumulating uh, heat variety so now this is the benefit we are uh, uh, expecting it is giving the benefit this uh, benefits to the farmer benefits to the consumer and benefits to the processor so basically such kind of the uh, high iron accumulating wheat variety or wheat produce that is could that could be utilized by the uh, consumers and processor then in the value chain they are having high concentration of the iron that could be by available through human intestine and this is the na nano iron booster technology in the morning dr uh, ddg uh, crop science is uh, uh, basically referring this nano iron booster technology for b5 fortification that is been awarded krishi satya samman 2018 by central agriculture minister sri radha mohan singh at ashok hotel new delhi it is basically the mahindra and mahindra samradhi award uh, category so other nano nutrient developed at our university particularly nano formulation for treating iron deficiency anemia so here we are using these foliar uh, vegetables spinach chalai or maybe other like uh, in the mandel khand there is a project, there is a, another uh, uh, kind of the foliar vegetables uh, present that is called koi and nari and all they are having high amount of the iron but this high iron of uh, iron sometimes is not tolerated by the human being because of the presence of oxalate and other things and we have basically reduced the uh, uh, concentration of these oxalate and silicate by making these green synthesis of nanoparticle using another plant extract this is another green technology and basically we have characterized and all these particles are showing in nano in dimension and ultimately such kind of these nano preparation they could be utilized for making syrup tablet then concentrate juice and soup so basically in vitro study has been done utilizing this uh, in vitro cell culture system where we found that such kind of the preparation is really tolerating much higher concentration of these iron as compared to normal counterpart so now another technology which we have developed utilizing the this uh, curcuminoids from the turmeric and uh, this is again green technology where we have made the six fold higher bioavailability or six fold more water solubility of the curcuminoid content present in the turmeric by utilizing simple processing method and this shows that this processing method is giving the production of more amount of the nanoparticles and this uh, the curcuminoid become water soluble by this processing method so such kind of the nano curcuminoid would be utilized for uh, treatment of the bone diseases and also inflammatory diseases like cancer or other age related uh, age associated diseases then uh, application of nanotechnology in food basically you know that uh, this has been uh, utilized in the uh, production of nano agri food system and uh, these are the basically uh, could be developed by utilizing nano carrier system for delivery of the nutrient and supplement then uh, organic nano sized uh, additive for food supplement and animal feed then food packaging applications like plastic polymer containing or coated with nano material for improved mechanical or functional property then nano coating on food contact surface for barrier or antimicrobial property this is another important uh, nano coating now it is a very uh, important field that is emerging in the in the food in, uh, and required by the food industries and then nano sensor food for food labeling then uh, food safety and biosecurity and uh, this is again very very important aspect we have to always when we are developing these nanotechnologies we have to ensure food safety and biosecurity issue then material science and then food processing and product development so these are the enormous application of the nanotechnology that has been there in the food industries and uh, uh, particularly uh, also to minimize the pre and post harvest losses by this nano packaging and that's that will really give good quality uh, produce and high self life 
while utilizing this smart packaging then nano delivery and in, uh, invention of new herbal remedies you know very well that uh, every vegetables and fruits they are having many secondary metabolites and these secondary metabolites are having very very important role to play under under the biological system like isoflavin lutein lycopene proanthocyanate fistin so resveratrol all these are very very important bioactive compound of fruits and vegetables and if we are utilizing these compound for making uh, the uh, nano uh, encapsulate if we are encapsulating these material then uh, the delivery will be much faster and uh, this will be giving much better impact much better human impact and then uh, we have also developed uh, the nano size carrier for oral delivery and uh, where we have to utilize this uh, food and drug approved polymers and liposome for delivery purposes they are the metal based nanoparticle lipid based nanoparticle polymer based nanoparticle and biological nanoparticle so these are the different kind of the uh, nanoparticulate drug delivery system that could be developed not only for the delivery of the drug but simultaneously also the delivery of the food nutrients and the uh, other uh, ingredients now these are the emulsion nano emulsion that is been developed uh, and ultimately they, they, these uh, these nano emulsion they have been fortified with vitamin uh, fat soluble vitamin a e and iron and also such kind of the nano emulsion if we are mixing or with milk they are called milk fortified with micronutrient encapsulated nano emulsion and uh, this is another nano delivery system which we have developed in our laboratory utilizing very simple nano emulsion utilizing the uh, sesame based oil and subsequently the nano emulsion which is been stabilized by the uh, finger millet prolamine protein and it is also hydrophobic protein and it is giving wetter basically stabilizing capacity and such kind of the nano emulsion developed in our laboratory have been tested under in vitro in vitro cell culture system utilizing the keko2 cell line and we found that there is a, they are facilitating basically the uptake of the fat soluble oh, vitamin yes, in the intestine system yes, 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 yes. and uh, they have lot of applications for biofortification of milk and other dairy product and they also facilitate the development of nutraceutical or other functional food or other the lipo uh, phil philic molecules now this is another uh, invention which we have made where finger millet functional ingredient that is been isolated from the finger millet seed and they have been utilized for making nano preparation and preparation have been utilized for facilitation of calcium Achha. uptake and inducing osteocyte differentiation and bone mineralization and we have done lot of study on this and ultimately if we are able to isolate this ingredient and uh, utilizing it for treatment of bone diseases such as osteoporosis and calcium disorder you know very well that uh, madhua ragi is considered to be very beneficial for the uh, uh, person who are suffering from the uh, bone related disorder like osteoporosis so under this circumstances we want to find it out what are the ingredient that is ultimately causing the induction of osteocyte differentiation and bone mineralization you know very well that while the bone is developed there is osteoclast is converted into osteoblast and osteoblast is either has to undergo the osteocyte differentiation and mineralization process then bone regeneration process be begin so this is the principle which, which has been utilized and to find it out how these ingredient are acting on to the on to the bone formation and this is the thing you can see how these nano emulsion can very well penetrate through the human intestine and ultimately they will enter into the interstitial fluid and they will be bioavailable and utilized and similarly not only the prolamine from the finger millet we also utilize the galactomenens from fenugreek seed and this is also utilizing utilized as a very good emulsifying agent and also hydrophilic solid carrier now this these are the nanotechnology research which we are proposing at rani lakshmibai central agriculture university where our focus is in two important area of agri food nutrition one is the development of nano agri input and where we are working on development of nano fortified organic fertilizer using consortium of beneficial microorganisms and nano nutrient for growth promotion of the cereal then modulation of root architecture 
and to augment secondary metabolite production in medicinal plant through application of nanomineral particle and particularly we are looking it into the bedani uh, somnifera satavari and other medicinal plant then use of nano copper nanoparticle to potentiate the action of defense inducer for effective management of alternary species and then biosynthesis of basically plant oil and cow bio, cow based by uh, cow, cow byproduct mediated copper nanoparticle uh, on emulsion against soil bar pathogen in the in the uh, food and fodder crop now this is the, the another area this green synthesis of iron rich nanoparticle as potential iron booster formulation to boost crop production and biofortification and then agronom agronomic augmentation for fodder crop through use of the uh, nano iron and this is the another application which we have done at pannagar where we have developed lateral flow immunodiffusion uh, device for diagnosis of the carnal one disease and such kind of the lateral flow uh, immuno diffusion dipstick method that could be utilized not only for uh, food safety purposes but also simultaneously for agri surveillance measures and then uh, now this is the time where we need translational research for fetching ipr in agri food nutrition through application of the nanotechnology and here we need have need to have transition from process patent to product patent because now we are developing mostly the product application is mostly lies on the product development then uh, research which we are conducting in the modern technological development for designing novel agri input pharmaceutical not nutraceutical cosmeceutical and other nano delivery system and nano material so while we are developing these these product patent we can be easily fetched then uh, we have to have sharing of the financial resources by industry and inter institutional normally on 50 50% basis in the morning our uh, ddg is also pointing out that while we want to take the uh, technology from lab to the field condition since inception we have to have industry uh, uh, academy industry linkages and henceforth since inception of the project we require such kind of the uh, um, measures so that we can take the technology from lab to the field condition then uh, ownership of the uh, uh, intellectual property that should lies both industry and in, in institution then uh, we have to require the setting up the national facility in university and national institution and also establishment of newer method system and facilities for integrated research in agri food nutrition so now every agriculture university including our university have to focus not only on to the production of the uh, production of the crop but simultaneously we have to look upon the uh, important aspect related to food and nutrition as well and now at the last our future lies in nanotechnology and this is been said by dr our former president dr apj abdul kalam who addressed to the scientist and technology in april 2005 in uh, delhi and he said we believe that nanotechnology would give us an opportunity if we take appropriate and timely action to become one of the important technological nation in the world the world market in 21st century is for nano material nano tools nano devices and nano biotechnology which put together is expected to be over 100 billion dollars nano technology is a new technology that is knocking at doors in every walk of life including agriculture so you can understand the statement made by our former president dr apj abdul kalam and this is indicating the the future of nano technology in agriculture and thank you thank you very much and this slide further indicating if we are having healthy plants healthy animals healthy humans then we have to have healthy planet and this is basically one health concept and this one health concept is really could be able to fulfill by the application of nanotechnology that is jeevo jeevas jeevanam one living entity is for, is food for another in the struggle for the existence so thank you thank you very much for your patience here thank you so much sir for sharing your views and research outputs in the areas of nano agriculture for agri food nutrition 
your ideas and experience on nanotechnology will definitely help our participants for achieving their research goals. Thank you, sir. Now the session is open for discussion. Participants are requested to please raise their hand and ask their question one by one to avoid any cues. Dr. Tanuj, please unmute the participants. Uh, First, Akshay Kuredekar. Okay, please, you can ask. Uh, good noon, sir. Myself, Akshay Kuredekar from University of Agriculture Science, Bangalore. Sir, I have a doubt regarding green synthesis, in, synthesis of nanoparticles. Sir. Here we are using a precursor in order to synthesize particular micronutrients or any nutrients. When you are using a precursor, like it might be a chemical. For example, for iron oxide nanoparticle, we are using perichloride. When using a chemical, why we are calling it as a green synthesis approach? And the second part of this is that what is the stability of this green synthesized nanoparticles? Thank you, sir. Okay, I think uh, you have rightly pointed out uh, the green synthesis method. You know, nu nutrient is nutrient. Whether it is a nanonutrient or the minerals or the present in the iron form or maybe other form. Ultimately, while you are reducing the size by reduction process, that is called bottom-up approach, then size will be decreased so that uh, bioavailability of this nu nu nutrient will be very much there. And sim simultaneously, you will find the better advantages and they will work even very, very lower concentration because ultimately the, there is a interaction of the uh, minerals with the molecules that is there in the biological system. So if it is having less size, size is less, then it, it, its interaction is very much there and ultimately they are giving the uh, profound impact in the biological system. Yes, sir, what is the stability of this uh, synthesized nanoparticle through green synthesis? Okay, I think uh, as usual, you know, whenever uh, nanoparticle is being utilized by the biological system, because they are requiring in very, very uh, little amount. However, if excessive amount is there, then again, just like any of the nano and uh, any of the nutrient, they are also get precipitated. They will not remain there as such in the in the form of uh, uh, nano material. And after interaction, either they have to go to the biological system. And then subsequently, they, in the environment, if they are persisting, they are present just like the normal ion. Sir, even I have synthesized the nanoparticle using some weed species, sir. Uh, within two to three days, the particle was showing within the nanoparticle size, within 100 nanometer. But after one week, again, I went for characterization. The size was around 500 to 600 nanometers. Sir. Yes, yes. There, there, there is a formation of aggregate. And these aggregates could be minimized while you are doing the coating. Coating is also very, very important process. One is, this is called capping process. After synthesis, you have to cap them so that aggregate formation is not there. So you have to look upon what are the methods you are following and how to make more stable nano preparation. And uh, until unless you are not, uh, after reduction, you are not doing the capping, that uh, nanoparticle will rem not remain sustained and they will form the aggregates. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Next question. Dr. Nil, Dr. Nil, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sir. Very yeah, much. thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for this exciting talk. Yeah, I think it's very, very much informative. But uh, I think a lot of overlapping. We would like to see a lot of collaboration. I think uh, you touch a lot of uh, important uh, means uh, issues like anemia. We have a big issue in anemia. I think you mentioning that we need to do the translation research. I think we would like and we invite you to do research with us in uh, Ames of Bhopal for uh, this uh, in the future. Yeah, iron is a very big issue. And uh, definitely, uh, as uh, we also discussed a little bit, the plant is also, soil also deficient in iron. I think there are ways how we can potentiate the uh, availability and the, the concentration of iron in our soil and how we can have a better growth as I'm very surprised to see that iron content is affecting the growth of the plant as well. Yes, so yes. I think it's not only important for human being RB, for our RBC, but also good for uh, for our plant. I think there are a lot of scope, scope whole, for future. Whole, whole value chain, whole food chain. Yeah. It is yeah, very much good. important, sir. It's very important and uh, you well characterize all these uh, material. But my concern is because the soil specifically in middle uh, 
uh, India here in uh, Madhya Pradesh is uh, have a high high iron. So mean in that scenario, they, somebody told me that iron is also interfering the growth of these uh, plants. Means if they are in excess, is any uh, is there any explanation for that? Yes, sir. There is a phytotoxicity is there. So okay. while we are using excessive of any of the nutrient. Mm -hmm. They are phytotoxic to plant, uh, not only plant, animals, microorganisms everywhere. So we have to uh, uh, see the status of the um, these uh, iron or zinc in the soil, mm -hmm. and accordingly okay. we have to take interventions. Okay, because uh, from Australia, Australia we have a big issue for high concentration of iron and all these heavy metals uh, there. Is there any chance we can chelate these uh, these high concentration of iron from soil? Any conventional or any, any method is possible? Yes. Uh, I think uh, only way only way if we are able to reduce their size. Uh, okay. And that's why uh, method uh, that is required. That is, I say, because I personally believe that uh, nobody is uh, convincing with my thought. That hmm. uh, this cow-based uh, agriculture farming, okay. basically the cow urine and the cow-based uh, this cow dung or maybe other byproduct, they are ultimately causing the reduction in the size of, of the these uh, minerals present in the soil, and hmm. henceforth they are making more bioavailable to the plant, and simultaneously they are also reducing the toxicity effect. I think uh, you must be knowing that uh, if we are taking the pills of the iron, they are mm. very much uh, causing the discomfort in our yeah. intestine. Absolutely. If we, yeah. if, we, if we are making biogenic nano iron particle and mm -hmm. we look upon, I think this will uh, solve the problem of anemia. That is yeah, possible. My, yeah, my talk is also similar, uh, like a similar direction tomorrow. So we will be using a super paramagnetic nanoparticle iron oxide. I think uh, uh, I'll touch these things uh, tomorrow in uh, more detail for translation research, which we which did in Australia. So thank you very much. Thanks for only this sir, excited only, uh, only talk. Sir, I, I must tell you that uh, while we are uh, using this spinach or maybe other leafy vegetable, they are providing uh, stomach discomfort sometimes. Mm. Because of the iron, not only the iron, simultaneously also the oxalate and, uh, and oxalate as well as these uh, um, uh, other, uh, uh, this oxalate is mainly causing mm -hmm. the stomach uh, discomfort. But if you see, if you are uh, reducing it uh, by utilizing simple green technology, mm. then uh, you will find they are uh, tolerated by the human intestine very well. Yeah, that's great. So we'll we'll uh, continue this uh, topic again tomorrow morning. Yeah. yeah yes, Thank sure. you very much for this talk. Thanks. Any any other qu queries from the audience? Sir, Doctor uh, Seva Nayak um, put a question on the chat box. That's how long the nanoparticles works on the crop. The Seva Nayak, are you there? What is the question? Question is, sir, how long the nanoparticles work on the crop? Put this question on the chat box. How long? Nanoparticles work on the crop. How long or how duration? What is the duration? Actually, actually, you know very well, I told you that uh, nano uh, uh, particles they are uh, interacting directly to the biological machinery. And this is the requiring very low concentration of these nanonutrients. And after interaction with the biomolecules, their work is over because they are ultimately uh, transported to the human cell, uh, to the to the biology, uh, to the cellular system, and ultimately they are affecting other machinery so that they will able to provide their impact. However, if uh, if it is not interacting and remain in the rhizosphere, then it will uh, convert it into uh, again in the form of the uh, basically iron, uh, not normal iron that is in the form of uh, ferric uh, uh, chloride, ferric sulfate, whatever. So it will be in immediately converted into uh, this um, natural form. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt in between. But uh, uh, we have to start next presentation as uh, Dr. Ramesh Ralia has some urgent assignment thereafter. So uh, we are going to start uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, Ralia lecture.
डॉक्टर रमेश रलिया जी इज जनरल मैनेजर एंड हेड रिसर्च एंड डेवलपमेंट इंडियन फार्मर्स फर्टिलाइजर कोऑपरेटिव लिमिटेड इंडिया नाउ आई इनवाइट डॉक्टर रमेश रलिया फॉर हिज की नोट लेक्चर ऑन नैनो फर्टिलाइजर फॉर सस्टेनेबल एंड प्रिसीजन एग्रीकल्चर डॉक्टर रमेश रलिया इज ए साइंटिस्ट वर्किंग ऑन नैनो टेक्नोलॉजी He is the inventor of Nano Urea, the first nano fertilizer product in India. Received regulatory approval and being used across the country and abroad. Expertise of Dr. Raliya includes design and development of nano scale materials, translational research from lab to land, regulatory policy support and predictive analysis, execution of pilot to industry scale products, and exploring interdisciplinary application of nano. Dr. Raliya is affiliated with various. Uh, organizations such as washington university usa royal society of uh, uk dr raliya has more than 100 publication in his record and three books 17 patent applications his papers has been cited more than 14 4500 times with an h index of 35 dr raliya is a member of many renowned societies such as american chemical society royal society of chemistry uk american association for the advancement of uh, science Uh, presently, Dr. Raliya is at IFCO. He is leading its Nano Biotechnology Research Center for developing nanotechnology-based solutions for sustainable and precision agriculture. Now, I request Dr. Raliya to begin with his presentation. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, uh, Dr. Prasant ji, uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Tilak Raj Sharma ji, uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar ji, Honorable Vice Chancellor sir. Uh, Dr. Amresh Chandra ji, director. Uh, Dr. Anil Kumar ji, who just uh, given his very detailed lecture about nanotechnology application, and then at last Dr. Prasant Jumlekar ji for giving me an opportunity to interact with this community here on this platform uh, and talk about nano material application in agriculture. i am so grateful to all of you for giving me the time and uh, opportunity to interact with all of you i feel sorry that uh, uh, i have to little rush and uh, like because of me the question answer session was little cut short because i have to travel and need to reach airport so i i'm going to start the presentation now uh, and i'm sorry if i missed someone's name to welcome uh, i welcome all of you who are present here and sharing my screen uh, so respected friends and uh, all sir and madam uh, i am going to talk about nanotechnology application for sustainable and precision agriculture current state and future perspective so let's ask the question that what kind of sustainability and precision we require and why we require that so this data is taken from united nation food and agriculture organization if we look on these graphs we see that all are the green dots are the population whether it is world or the different geographical region and then there are circles of orange and red those are in orange they are moderate to severe food insecurity and those are in red they are in severe food insecurity we all know that uh, united nation has certain sustainable development goals and in those sustainable development goals uh, the importance are related to agriculture as well that is about the uh, ending the hunger or the food security and others are related like whether it is water or whether it is health or whether it is poverty they all are related with the agriculture directly or indirectly if we look on this graph we can clearly see that uh, the food insecurity is also related to the economy of that region you see that the population of northern america and europe is uh, less than uh, what the other regions are but the food security is good there but in case of africa or asia where the highest uh, like relatively higher amount of population or number of people resides our food insecurity is higher and to address those concerns even we compare asia and africa that can be seen directly so 
so when we talk about economy it is linked with the access of the technology that whether the technology is available but whether the technology is accessible or not so those are the uh, challenges we will talk that how that can be addressed and things like that then if it if we see about the major crops uh, relate major crops in the in the world like being uh, talked about whether it is uh, maize or rice wheat or soybean so i just took an example of these um, uh, four crops and to see that what is their current pr productivity and what kind of productivity we will require and we took the base year of 2008 if we take that base year of 2008 and if we see the population of 2050 the forecast is there will be a population of more than uh, 9.5 billion people on the earth and that means that we have to increase the yield by 2.4% each year for these crops up to 2050 and without bringing additional land under the cultivation so considering those points we have to seriously look after what kind of technologies we are going to develop whether it is seed whether it is uh, inputs whether it is post harvest minimize technologies for minimizing the post harvest losses and beyond so if we see that how we are achieving food security so far so i'm i'm putting some examples here one is related to the um, uh, certainly the green revolution i hope that everyone can recognize that uh, that gen that has a in involvement of genetics that we are having hybrid seeds then we are having machines whether it is uh, it based or whether it, they are mechanical machines and then agrochemicals whether it is fertilizers pesticides and so on then we were having some technologies related to the drip irrigation so that we can save the water i can recall when i was going to the school uh, days about 20 years ago uh, at that time because i also come from a farmer family so my parents were dig, uh, were taking the water from the from the well at that was about 200 to 300 feet down the ground but today when i go to how home and see the farm field they they are harvesting the water of more than 1200 feet 1200 feet down the ground so certainly the water is significantly the availability of water is less and uh, at some part of the country the availability is less some part of the country availability is higher but so it is an uneven distribution uh, but when we need there is no water uh, or less accessible of that then uh, this drip irrigation came and this basically saved our water uh, saved our problem of excess water use and through the drip irrigation we were able to save the water of about um, 50 to 50 to 70% uh, of the water losses we were able to save that uh, by using the principles of mass balance and flow all that and then uh, there is a very good book related that combat uh, ready kitchen uh, this in this book like they are basically telling that how the us military over the period of time they discovered a lot of technologies to keep the food safe and increase the shelf life texture and flavor and quality of the food for extended period of time Uh, the name is combat ready because they were developed the us army was working on uh, various technologies to keep the food uh, for longer period of time for their military who is like uh, fighting abroad uh, for various reasons and uh, then certainly i have mentioned one of the equation and i hope everyone has recognized that this is the formation of uh, ultimately the haber boss process and ultimately making the nitrogen as fertilizer so these are the technologies uh, so far helping across the globe to sustain the food security whatever we are but still if we see the data more than 800 million people across the world are not having adequate food so it means that we will not only need technologies for today's agriculture but we will also need uh, technologies for tomorrow's agriculture to feed the people so i have used the word uh, so word uh, the nitrogenous based fertilizer and but before going forward before i move back on this fertilizer problem i will talk about what is the current problems that we are facing 
like for example what are the foundation problems uh, one is realization of malthus this is about the malthus theory of population where they are talking about population versus resource so when the when the population is very high resources are limited and then after the certain period of time there will be a conflict for the resources and then the population will be fluctuate around the resources based on the resources availability then over the period of time as i have discussed shrinking the farmland because population is increasing everywhere in the city we are working uh, or we have worked on if we go there there were farm farmland is being converted into all these big townships and uh, uh, all these big malls roads infrastructures to sustain the population then there is an impact of climate change certainly it's there because if we see even with the weather pattern of today or uh, last one week or last one month we can see that when the usually the rain starts in the june uh, second week to grow the crops in the monsoon region and then at this time used to crops require like little high intense sun and less humidity in the air but uh, the situation is little opposite that we are having more rain at this time for the extended period of time and we all know that if the if there is an extended period or shifting of 10 to 15 days of humidity and uh, uh, water availability moisture availability in the soil uh, then this affects the microbial population or microflora in the rhizosphere region and uh, if this persistent over a period of time we say that it's in climate change and there are a lot of factors for that climate change uh, but majorly we all know that like uh, limited also the limited natural mineral resources uh, this particularly i written here for the fertilizer availability agrochemical availability and their distribution like for example uh, india is agriculture rich country but we are importing lot of fertilizers and other agrochemicals uh, because we don't have the adequate resources natural resources in our country is uh, based on uh, to meet the total demand so that's why we are getting it from the other countries uh, and similarly like if we talk about like global perspective like phosphate reserves so phosphate reserves are pockets in the different part of the globe but uh, agriculture if you see agriculture map and global resources map they are on the different um, different location different perspective similarly the diversion food and biomass energy so earlier we used to grow the food for food consumption but now we are also growing certain food crops for the energy application perspective like we are getting ethanols from corn uh, from uh, wheat or from rice barns or so on so food crops are also being used for biomass energy and many of these crops are required a lot of water fertilizer to grow them uh, and then energy intensive like fertilizer water and fertilizer industry if we see the process like harvesting the water from the ground ground or making the fertilizer like nitrogenous fertilizer like these are like one of the most energy expensive processes and then we are doing intense agriculture over the period of time so that is affecting our biological health of soil and then the huge efficiency of currently used agrochemicals whether it is pesticides herbicides uh, or fertilizers uh, their huge efficiency is limited uh, to less than 30 40% and in some cases uh, it is even less than 5% so these are like um, uh, like these are foundation problem uh, based on literature which we understand uh, so if we talk about particularly the fertilizer because on i'm talking about fertilizer because on that reason i'm working on that and that's of my interest here uh, to talk so fertilizer products so let's question that what are the fertilizer role and what kind of fertilizers so far developed so many fertilizers mainly like npk whenever we talk about fertilizer they take was talk in industries that npk what is availability of npk what is manufacturing of npk what is the price of that and among npk uh, the major is major portion is covered by nitrogen and the reason talking about npk because the throat the globe uh, the soil is deficient with these nutrients in their plant available form and importance of particularly the nitrogen fertilizer can be seen that if we do not have this herbivorous process today the global population would have been around 3.5 billion uh, 
but because nihaber was process was discovered nitrogen synthetic fertilizers were available and that is the reason that the global population is sustained uh, beyond 7 billion today uh, and this is very basic slide so i will not spend time on that this basically showing the difference between legume and non legume plants and the use efficiency of uh, the major fertilizers like nitrogen and phosphorus. So the huge efficiency is limited by about 30% or around 30%. So the, the, the challenge is how to increase the huge efficiency and assimilation, effectiveness of whether the nutrient available in the soil or the nutrients which you are applying from the outside. If we see the challenge of uh, less uh, huge efficient fertilizers, or uh, agrochemicals. This is true for other agrochemicals as well. These fertilizers used in excess amount, when these fertilizers have lesser huge efficiency than we apply in excess amount. And that is uh, very well known in through all government and university data uh, that the ratio of NPK is highly imbalanced uh, in India, in many states. Uh, and when we use this excess fertilizer, this fertilizer get runoff and ended up into the water bodies or into the air or into the soil through the groundwater and so on. And uh, if we particularly talk about nitrogenous fertilizer, which is used the most uh, fertilizer type, and uh, if it is in and among that nitrogenous fertilizer, the urea is the most and uh, through the urea, when the urea is not being used, it be basically released in form of nitrous oxide and nitrous oxide is one of the potent global warming uh, greenhouse gas, which causes the global warming and ultimately the climate change impacts. And also they are having their other uh, pollution inputs like soil, air and water and so on. So what are the efforts being made? And efforts at the two level, one is efforts at the regulation and policy level, and another is at the R&D level that we all are, we all are doing. At the policy level, if we are talking about global perspective, there are various programs related to like nutrient stewardship framework programs related to sustainability and policy practices. Then there are about they are talking about ban of inefficient fertilizers. Uh, or use with certain additives so that their use efficiency or losses can be minimized. And then there are discussions among the different groups that who will pay for the uh, this fertilizer-based pollution or agrochemical-based pollution, whether it is manufacturer, whether it is users or government should get it. And if we talk about the research and development so far, so the research and development happened so far or being happening is one is the coating of fertilizers. I coat the fertilizers with different kind of components for the slow release or reduced volatilization. In India, we are using like neem coating, uh, neem oil coated urea fertilizer is being used very common because, and we all know that it has the hydrophobic core and because of that, it basically volatilization can be minimized and use efficiency can be increased. Then there is mixing of multinutrients, whether it is micronutrient, macronutrients. Uh, like these days coming like zincated urea or NPK along with other micronutrients like that. And then enabling them to dissolve, there were like uh, starting of uh, water soluble fertilizers or liquid fertilization, whether it is through drip irrigation, through foliar application and so on. And then about the co-fertigation that uh, um, use of more of excess amount of chemicals affecting the soil. So let's use uh, some chemical based fertilizer along with some bio fertilizers there might be like microorganisms or their active ingredients or part of their uh, microbial cells uh, then there is in about the uh, reduction in the particle size for the better dispersion better use efficiency better uptake efficiency and that's what the nano scale or nanotechnology is start coming in the picture so let's talk about what are the nanotechnology application in agriculture. What is nanotechnology and how good it is? What are the concerns for that? We all are aware that nanoparticles are having particle size of one and 100 nanometer, at least at one dimension. And when these particles are converted at such a small scale, their surface area to volume size ratio is increased and thereby they require in 
thereby they require in less amount uh, to have the equal or better impact on the crop. So there are various applications in agriculture related to nanotechnology, also mentioned in previous uh, talk, uh, like a lot of different applications across the sectors. So here the application related to, specifically related to plants, it starts with sensor to detect the disease, detect the nutritional profile, uh, detect the plant health and uh, predict, prediction of that. And then nanofertilizers and use of use in genetic engineering. We all know that we were using these gold uh, particles to attach the genetic material, DNA and RNA, and then use the gene bun to insert that to the plant cells. So now instead of those gold, basically we can make a very tiny gold nanoparticles. We can load the DNA or RNA into that, and then we can target it deliver to the plants. And uh, we even we don't need the gene gun by direct foliar spray and so on. And then uh, nanopesticides, there are various applications, whether based on um, biological agents, uh, biodegradable molecules, and so on. Then there are nanoparticles being used for seed coatings, also nanofertilizer through soil applications, then soil microbial manipulations, uh, whether it is genetic uh, manipulation or whether it is manipulation in the biodiversity in the rhizosphere. And then the soil conditioning. Conditioning means like whether it is uh, balancing the pH or other content in the rhizospheric zone. So there are various applications of this nanotechnology for agriculture. And if we talk about what kind of nanoparticles are being used, they are used in two forms. One is uh, uh, nanoparticle as an active ingredient and another is nanoparticle as a carrier carrier molecules. So what kind of materials are being used? It depends on what kind of application we are looking for and how we are looking for. Uh, since there are like a lot of detail we can discuss. So I have mentioned like a couple of articles here, uh, uh, which we have written and to also our colleagues. So one is nano fertilizer for precision and sustainable agriculture. This published in JFC, and then in Nature Nanotech related to guiding design space for nanotechnology for sustainable crop production. And similarly, some articles featured in Forbes uh, related to nanotechnology application from agriculture to pharmaceutical applications. So these are the articles basically are showing in detail summary that what kind of nanomaterials are being in practice for different uh, sectors and how they are beneficial, how their impacts are coming in like that. So when we see about the application, uh, giving the nutrients to the plants, if we talk about agrochemicals or fertilizers, pesticides, uh, we have developed nanomaterials and given to the plants through various mode, whether it is soil application, which is very conventional, the aerosol, the foliar application, then the drop cast. And we have attached equipments like scanning mobility particle sizers and inductive coupled plasma mass spec. And these equipments tells us that how many number of particles we are applying to the plants, and then how much actually the number of particles absorbed by the plant. And once they are absorbed, where they are going in the plant, the root, suit, leaching, atmosphere, where they are going. Where, once they enter, whether they are relate, uh, remain inside in the form of nano or they dissolve in form of ions, uh, or in what form they are getting metabolized. So those things, tracking and tracing of these nanoparticles in the plant, we are doing those studies. Below mentioned are the reference paper in which we have published these results of these articles. In form of the summary, I would like to mention that uh, what we have found that uh, using the aerosol applications or foliar applications, uh, we can achieve the maximum uptake efficiency of these nutrients by the plants, uh, which is like over 85%. And then if we do drop cast or soil, the use efficiency is less. The very evident reason that uh, these nanoparticles having certain surface phenomena, surface properties, uh, surface chemistry. Uh, so what happened that when we put these nanoparticles in the rhizosphere, in the soil, these particles comes in contact with the various other 
substances present in the rhizospheric zone. They change the carbon to hydrogen ratio on the surface, they change the zeta potential on the surface, they change the particle particle interaction ability, and thereby they affect uh, the, the particles aggregation and agglomeration kinetics. These and but through uh, target delivery application method, we can achieve the uptake, best uptake efficiency, their target release inside the plant, uh, and these nutrient remain in the plant. These nutrients, those who are applied, can be kept in plant available form so that their use efficiency is less and they require less by mass volume because of their surface area to volume size ratio, and they improve the productivity and uh, hopefully the agriculture sustainability because they require in less quantity to produce the uh, required amount. Uh, uh, then uh, the delivery of these nanoparticles, uh, these nanoparticles we are delivering through, as I mentioned, foliar applications. I would like to show you the couple of uh, things here that when you put in the nanoparticles in distilled water or di water or deionized water and then you, when you put nanoparticles in soil solution so when you put this particle in soil solution these particles get aggregated and as i mentioned they change the carbon to oxygen ratio zeta potential and different ionic strength that's why it basically affect the the, the particles uptake efficiency and so on uh, we are we have developed a lot of methods to manufacture nanoparticles uh, as mentioned previously, there are various methods, physical, chemical, biological, aerosols, plasma, like a lot of methods to manufacture nanoparticles. Uh, we have developed various methods to manufacture nanoparticles, both through top-down approach and through bottom-up fabrication approach. And as you can see that we can tune the nanoparticles from size, from morphology, from surface properties, uh, whether they are using a sensor, whether they are using a carrier, whether they are using an active ingredient, so we can develop those nano particles. We have developed very, various state of art reactors, uh, which basically can synthesize nanoparticles in little mass scale uh, and uh, with the tuned properties. So far, we have developed a range of nanomaterials from metal to bimetallic, bilayer, triple layer, metal oxide, carbon nanomaterials, and other nanomaterials for different applications. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge here all my collaborators who explored the applications beyond our synthesis approach. So we have synthesized these are like different nanoparticles of size, shape, and application perspective. And would be happy to collaborate with any of the attendees you would like to in future as well. Uh, so when we ap apply these nanoscale materials for agricultural application, it is very essential because these are the novel materials having different features, properties. And you know that 10 nanometer materials has different property than uh, 30 nanometer. 30 nanometer has different than 70 nanometers. So these all are, when we talk about precision, we have to talk about the size. We have to talk about shape, crystal phase, surface data potentials. Uh, like like precision in everything and these particles are having unique properties and properties different than their conventional bulk part so it is essential to test and trial them first so we are testing these particles in both in the vertical farming as well as in the real world system in the controlled engineered environment where we grow the plant without soil or with soil or with artificial mediums uh, we test these nanoparticles through various means of uptake, whether it is soil, water, uh, through foliar application, through coatings, and so on. And then testing also in the real world field, in the farmer's field or uh, in the farm field, real farm field, to test their efficacy, efficiency. One of the products that we have developed related to the uh, urea or nitrogenous fertilizer, that's basically the nano urea. You might have heard this name. Uh, it is uh, India's first product approved by fertilizer control order. And it has been evaluated by various uh, institutes, organizations in India, belongs to Department of Biotechnology, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. Specifically related to this nano urea, which is uh, manufactured and market 
being marketed by uh, Indian Farmers Fertilizer Cooperative Limited. It has uh, the particle size about 20 to 50 nanometers, and whereas compared to urea is about one to three millimeters the, the grain size. It has a better surface area to volume size ratio, improved physical chemical properties, uptake volume rate and volume. Importantly, I would like to mention that number, mass, and surface area concentration. Whenever we talk about nanomaterials, we have to talk about what kind of concentration that we are using. Because for the nanomaterials, we cannot simply measure uh, the nanoparticles in mass concentration. We have to measure in terms of surface area. Because whenever we talk about nanomaterials, we have to talk about, we are talking about that surface area to volume size ratio increases. So, there should be the term related to the surface area concentration. And we have published one paper related to toxicology in this one, where we have this established uh, with other colleagues that how the surface area concentration is uh, more determining factor than the mass concentration and the number concentration. And then the release rate kinetics and biointactions are better with this nanomaterials. These are the some uh, images, characterization images of electron microscope, uh, as well as uh, the uh, hydrodynamic diameter and zeta potential. I hope people can recognize in this. Uh, the instruments and characterization techniques are very familiar. Uh, oops, going very fast. Okay. So when we apply these nanoparticles through the foliar application, these particles getting uptake uh, through different means. One is direct uptake, another is uptake by stomata, uh, stomatal opening or by the hydrothodes. Once these particles are uptake, these particles are translocated uh, from one part to another part based on source to sink, like from transloading, uh, from translocation and so on through the simplest mechanism. And then they are interplay for various physiology and morphology, different plants requirement, time release, and so on, uh, and transport within the plant system. We have tested various nanoparticles in past as well, related to like nanomaterials, and this is uh, some commercial name that is active plant. Uh, that has better huge efficiency to increase the leafy biomass without compromising with the uh, nutritional quality as mentioned in the previous talk that increasing the zinc and iron content is important for human health that can be achieved similarly we are working on how to increase the uh, absorption of photosynthetically active radiations uh, Photosynthetic active radiations are basically the lights being absorbed by the plant leaf to increase the photosynthesis or to perform the photosynthesis. And when the photosynthesis is better, biomass is better and biomass can be converted into heat or the leaf biomass. Uh, particularly related to the nano urea, uh, we have tested in across India. As you can see on the different Indian maps, uh, uh, sorry, on Indian maps, there are different locations marked with the red and green, yellow color uh, and violet color. Uh, these are the number of trials uh, stations, trial stations. We have taken the trial across the country on over 94 crops and more than 11,000 farmers field uh, with the ICR and cursive campaigns and in which more than 20 state agriculture universities and ICR institutes were involved and uh, the trials were conducted for about three years uh, and the conclusion is on an average it can increase the yield by eight percent and when we use this nano urea we can reduce the requirement of conventional urea, which is broadcasted. Once the seed germinated, we do the broadcast of urea. If we reduce the broadcast urea by 50% and use the nano urea instead of that, it can increase the yield up to 8%. And it enhances the nutritional quality in terms of protein content, fiber content, and other uh, amino acid concentration, nitrogen concentration, and so on. Uh, this particular product has been tested and evaluated as per the guideline of, for the evaluation of nano-based agri input and food products in India. So in India, we are having this guideline uh, from the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Tech, and uh, Ministry of Ag and Farmers Welfare. Uh, these two ministries have released a guideline that any nanomaterials developed and uh, you being used in agricultural application, how to evaluate or perform the evaluation, what are the methods, what are the factors, tests to be conducted. So this particular product, nano urea, which commercialized in India, uh, 
has been tested as per this DPT guideline and also as per the international guidelines of OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, after the complete evaluation, this nano urea particular product is uh, translated and it has been uh, included in the fertilizer control order, FCO that we call. And uh, this product launched early this year in uh, June, introduced in June. And uh, I have also talked a detailed talk about, particularly about this product, nano urea with the Hindu business line, the Hindu newspaper business line. Um, so you can listen if you are interested. And then we are very open for the collaboration technology sharing, as you can see that uh, we have collaborated with the Indian Council of Agriculture Research that comes for all the ICR institutes and state agriculture universities. We have collaborated with IIT Delhi uh, for further technological improvement and new product development on that. And then we are also sharing because, you know, like in India, we are uh, working on a principle called like Vasudev Kutumbukam, our popular prime minister is using this phrase popularly. So uh, since IFCO is a farmer's company and our aim is not only to develop that, the technology and product, but also to help the farmers and farmers will get help when it is being shared. So we have shared this technology at free of cost and uh, just as a token rupees of 100 to our second and third competitor in the this market to NFL and RCF. Uh, so that this product can be developed at the larger scale to give to the farmers. Uh, then, because it is a very new product, uh, relatively new product and made through relatively new technology, uh, so we have uh, uh, we have developed a dedicated website. Because you know, like many people has questions, uh, like how to use it, what kind of impacts, where did you test. How did you test? Uh, what is impact? Why it requires so less and like that? So all to address all those questions, uh, we have developed a dedicated website, uh, www.nanourea.in. Uh, so you can visit that and can find more detail about this, particularly about this product. Then because our uh, country, India has farmers, uh, which is either less educated or not educated. L like farmers, like my father, who is just like educated up to class 10 or 12, and uh, he doesn't know like much about science and all those things. So we have developed another a dedicated platform that is called Ifco Bajar. On that, either you can, either farmers or anyone can call out a 1223 number to know the detail about the product, or they can, uh, go there and read in the regional language. We have made this information available in so far in 12 major Indian languages. Uh, and then we are also trying to translate in other languages with the help of Google translation, uh, real-time translation uh, through the farmers. Uh, so in summary, uh, nano fertilizers for sustainable and precision agriculture, we are doing for target delivery, for controlled release, keeping nutrients in nutrients or other agrochemicals in plant available form, requiring less by mass volume, improves their productivity and sustainability, and addressing the challenge of emission and eutrophication, and complements the vision of various sustainable development goals related to agriculture, health, water, and food security, and hunger. But the question is larger, and the question says that in future, how we will let us. So to understand that we are having a lot of challenges related to climate change and then feeding over 10 billion population by 2050 and then limited availability and limited accessibility of whether it is natural resources like soil, air, water, or the other resources like seed, fertilizers, markets, education, technologies, and like that. Nanotechnology can play the important role by providing products and uh, platforms like sensors for real-time monitoring of plant and soil health, environmental health, uh, and making uh, and helping uh, help, help in providing data for the data science so that the predictive analysis and optimization can be done. Uh, 
Nanoscience can also help in reducing the mass volume requirement of agrochemicals uh, by increasing the use efficiency, by improving the activity properties and so on. Then the biotechnology plays an important role to improve the cellular efficiency. And I mean cellular efficiency by increasing the use efficiency, like for example, increasing the number of receptors on the root surface so that it can absorb the nutrient better. Even modifying the root uh, receptors so that plant can uptake in different form of nutrients and then ultimately it get metabolized inside the plant system and like that. Uh, then fortification, fortification of both soil for plants and plant food for humans, because plant require nutrients. If we look on the essential uh, macro and micronutrients, those are the same, nearly same kind of nutrients human require. So if our plant is deficient with the nutrient, then human is deficient with the nutrient as well. So because if, for example, plant is deficient with zinc, human will be deficient with the zinc and then we have to eat the zinc tablets. So this is just an example, but for the other animals as well. So with that, I would like to thank my financial supporters, uh, Indian Farmers Fertilizer Cooperative Limited, also Washington University in St. Louis, those work I have presented in this work, and also IIT Delhi, some work from there also presented, and then Nanobiotechnology Research Center, this R&D center, uh, we had established in Gandhinagar, Gujarat, and I would like to invite all of you. And uh, if you are interested, we would be happy to collaborate and explore the opportunities together uh, that what we can develop together for the next generation or uh, help the farmers. With that, I would like to thank again to all of you. I have time to take a few questions, uh, but uh, please note down this email address uh, to submit your questions because I have to rush to the airport to take the flight for travel. With that, I would like to thank you again and appreciate all of you for your time and opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your views on nano fertilizer for sustainable and precision agriculture. Nice presentation, sir. Your slides are self-explanatory and catchy. You emphasize on efforts to minimize the impact of unused fertilizer, both at regulation policy level and at R&D level. Your ideas and experience on nano fertilizer will definitely help us address the global problem of fertilizer pollution and to design the strategies to augment the nutrition, nutrient use efficiency by plants in a better way. So if you permit, we can take one or two questions. Absolutely, absolutely, please. And I would be happy to take a number of questions. You can send me an email uh, at rameshralia at gmail.com. I'm writing in the chat box. You can send me any questions there. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sure. Please start. Uh, any, any question uh, from the participant side? Please raise your hand. Any other? Any question? Hello. I think uh, Hello? your uh, lecture is uh, crystal clear to all the audience, <laughs> Dr. Elia. Uh, sir, thank you. But still, I believe that there are huge opportunities to improve in my uh, presentation as well as in the science. Always it is evolving. So, and I am again inviting all of you to, if possible, we can collaborate on various points because everyone has the unique strength, the, the, everyone present here. So in future, uh, I hope that we can meet and... Uh, I, I think uh, I think uh, I will ask our Vice Chancellor, if you can have trial of Inonor year at our farm, absolutely. that would be one thing. And another thing is that we have developed some of the things and that could be translated to the farmer field, where yeah. we require your help, your expertise, Sure. I'm sure that uh, these future collaboration will be beneficial sure. to you and uh, our university. Sure, sir. We would be like uh, happy to take the trial at your uh, university, and also I would like to uh, express my thanks for your invitation uh, to review the technologies available at the university. So we would be happy to sir, learn more about the product and uh, product developed at the university, and uh, would be glad to take them to the next stage. For yeah, the yeah, Mozilla. definitely, definitely, we'll uh, in touch with you. Yes. Uh, still, sir. I have one question. Yes. Sir. Uh, yeah, sir. As we all know, all the plant diseases 
are related to a kind of a, a deficiency of certain kind of nutrient which leads make them susceptible kind of so if we uh, come across with a particular disease is being uh, get uh, so the plant gets susceptible to it because of certain, some nutrient is it possible to go further to bring that nutrient or uh, can nutrient to bring it in a nano form and apply or spray it in the nano form so that we can uh, take care of some of the plant diseases is there any some work going on in this regard as Yes, we are working on uh, both as an nanomaterial as an active ingredient and also nano nanomaterial as a carrier agent because there are existing agrochemicals they can uh, mitigate that particular pathogenic disease or any of that disease if it is because of the biotic stress like any pathogenic uh, impact on that so existing so two kind of work that we are doing one is related to improving the efficacy and efficiency of existing molecules and the second is nanomaterial itself as an active ingredient where the nanomaterial can go and and influence the plant metabolism and uh, develop the resistance mechanism against that particular stress whether and that stress mechanism we are working on both abiotic and biotic but particular for the biotic we are also exploring the another one working with the existing agrochemicals which are having efficacy less than 10% in of the molecule cases i think uh, i think uh, uh, this uh, biogenic nanoparticle as well as the engineer nanoparticle they could be a good help for the plant disease management compared to your uh, encapsulated one or the material uh, which we are using for uh, taking these active ingredient into uh, their core cell so i think nano particle may be much better approach i feel it i don't know yes nano nano as an active ingredient works but like in some cases where the harvesting require quicker like for example if you apply today and you need harvesting day after or Uh, two days after then you have to get that uh, product get metabolized by the plant cell or it get is get consumed or get integrated into the metabolic cycle of the plants so for that uh, we are working on the life cycle assessment of various uh, in, uh, elements uh, at the nano scale sir and as you rightly said uh, certainly the biogenic nano particles are having advantages in terms of synthesis as well only the challenge currently the major challenge with biogenic nanoparticles are controlling the properties uh, if we would like to control the properties one property it is very easy like for example if we control the size it is easy but if i would like to control the size and crystal phase just an example like for example i am making titanium dioxide nanoparticles uh, through the fungus bacteria or plant extract or anything any animal extract uh, size can be controlled but if i would like to control that utile phase or anatase phase uh, then it is difficult to control both the properties simultaneously uh, so we are working on uh, some of those process that how can uh, these different properties can be fine tuned simultaneously as you said that uh, we have to metabolize our nanoparticle with the plant so is it a way to reduce the uh, re prevent the residue of the particular uh, ingredient which you are applying Yeah, uh, uh, residue, this, this. yes, residue accumulation certainly can be minimized uh, to have some coating of biodegradable organic molecules that can be maybe like an chain of amino acids or chain of glucose or some other uh, polysaccharides, maybe like cellulose, maybe like chitosan. Uh, there are like uh, or some other polymers like PVP. So these are the polymers kind of things that can be utilized. Also, there are uh, polymers. Uh, from the plant itself like you know like lignin uh, which is currently we are like having lot of huge best of plants so we are also exploring opportunities like lignin and cellulose which can be utilized and plant is very familiar to have these raw materials to build up their cell walls against the various uh, stresses abiotic stress and biotic stress and wounds so we are exploring those uh, If platforms as well. Okay, thank you, sir. Now keep the memories of this webinar alive forever.
Sir, please accept the token of love and gratitude from our side. I request Dr. S. K. Chaturvedi, Sir, Dean, College of Agriculture, to facilitate our eminent speaker with an amendment and say a few words uh, about Dr. Arya lecture. Good afternoon. Congratulations to Dr. Ramesh ji. Uh, really, I enjoyed the talk. And uh, not only me, but I feel that most of the colleagues, those who have joined, uh, must have been benefited by your lecture. Okay? It was so simple that uh, uh, even the students, I'm receiving some of the comments on my uh, email box, that uh, they are also very happy. And some of them, they have requested to share the uh, this PPT. So maybe it's already available on YouTube. So I think they can uh, go through. Uh, really, it was a very good talk. And uh, ma many things uh, uh, are now clear, at least in minds of uh, our colleagues and the students. And what I feel that, like you have said, that uh, enhancing nutrient use efficiency is must. Uh, yesterday, I had some discussion about the shortage of uh, phosphoric fertilizer because China has almost stopped the uh, export and uh, same is being followed by other countries. So now Morocco is the only country, maybe it's a little bit from somewhere else, otherwise Morocco is the only country from we are uh, getting the uh, phosphoric fertilizer. So really we have to be very careful in developing the nano fertilizer, particularly where a lot of import is there. So direct impact can be reduction in import first thing. Then uh, what uh, I feel over the last 40, 50 years, we have uh, unjudiciously used these fertilizers. So most of these fertilizers, when we say the use efficiency is only 20% or less than uh, that for some of the elements, then certainly those nutrients are fixed in soil. So maybe on long-term basis, those can be made available to the uh, crops as well. Uh, through some of the other techniques like the organic acids are there. So if we can develop some of the nanoparticles, those can enhance production of uh, organic acids as a root exudate. Probably more, more can be done in uh, within the soil. But it's already, nutrients are already fixed or they are available in the soil. So some kind of nanoparticles can be can help in that way also. Right? You have said that something like 50% reduction in urea consumption. It's not a small thing. It's a really big thing. And what uh, I feel personally that the availability of urea has increased, not because we are importing more, but it has increased because the uh, requirement has gone down. And uh, I can see very good future for nanoscience itself because many things are to yet to come. And at least with your vision, country has witnessed that what really we can do. Of course, that uh, your uh, nano urea has been, it's now becoming popular. And days are not uh, far ahead when this nano urea will take over entire, even the neem coated area, what I feel. Because the uh, purpose is also to see, have the slow release. And uh, we may be this. I think the science is available and many techniques are available. We can control the release of the uh, nitrogen for the soil in a uh, uh, slowest manner, I should say. So if we can control the release of the nitrogen or other nutrients in phase mirror or a bit slow, then certainly plants with can utilize in a uh, better way. And the efficiency of such uh, nutrients can easily be enhanced. And uh, on other day, our director uh, research, Dr. Uh, A.R. Sarmasa was delivering a lecture and he mentioned categorically that we have published many papers, but we could not move a hint in terms of enhancing nutrient efficiency, at least in our country. Many things have came in picture and uh, are too late. And here is the example with the nanoparticles or with the nano urea, at least the use efficiency has also increased. And it's not only the dependency. The best thing I could notice that something like 8% average in improvement in yield is also there. So if yield improvement is there, reduction in the urea consumption is there, Certainly, uh, such techniques will be uh, good for the farmers also because it, these techniques can be assumed as a uh, cost-cutting techniques because uh, always farmers are worried about the uh, increasing cost of cultivation. Government is also worried about so production or productivity enhancement is one thing. Reduction in, in cost is a big thing. 
and uh, I'm sure uh, really you have done a great job, and uh, we salute for that. And in uh, future, rightly, our uh, Dr. Anil Kumar sir has said that uh, we can collaborate. So let let us start with uh, a small note that we can start demonstrating here, so that the farmers of the Bundelkhand region they can visit the university and they can have a uh, first look over the technology being used in this country. Congress, really we appreciate, we are grateful for you, to you for sparing uh, time for today's uh, webinar and in the future, uh, it will continue. And uh, on behalf of uh, university and my own behalf, I invite you to visit uh, RLBC sometimes whenever it is possible and you have time, please. Thank thanks, you. thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi, sir. I sincerely accept your invitation and will visit. And I also would like to invite you to visit our R&D center with Anil Kumar, sir, and Prasant, sir, and all the other colleagues and participants who are interested uh, from November, because this month I am little out of the country. So we can meet our, in November. I am inviting all of you. I thank you again for giving me the opportunity to be acting with all of you. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks. Namaskar. Uh, now we are breaking for almost 45 minutes for one session. We'll start our next session by sharp 2.30 p.m. All are requested to join by 2.30 with the same link. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasant and Dr. Manit Rana. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. We are on time. Yeah. अरे फिर मुझे करने वाला नहीं आता मम्मी आज तो बहुत फूल भी नहीं है हाँ एक मशीन चलो तो कर ये ना हुआ तो क्या बात है कभी तो क्या आती है ना ना बहुत लेट होती है जब बिल्कुल ही सर पे चढ़ जाए तब के तब मम्मी को मिर्च मिर्च की हल्की फुल्की आती वरना नहीं आती मम्मी को तभी तो क्या चाहिए तुम भी दाल और
screen. Safran Zahir, lunch Yes, Safran Good afternoon, Dr. Jadi, sir. Are you there? Hello. Yeah, I am connected. Okay. Yeah, we'll be we'll start uh, within five minutes, sir. Okay. Would I like to share my uh, presentation? Yes, yeah. Uh, you can you can share now. Okay. Just I am going to share. First slide will be there. Okay. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. This is okay. Yes, it's okay. So, what is uh, time here now? This is yeah. nine. Uh, so I am in time. Okay. Yes. Um. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll start. I am visible? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Slide is visible. Okay. Uh, I welcome all the participants. Please put on your video, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Please, please, yes, sir, uh, on please put video. on your video. Sir, up the video uh, on. Is video off? Hai? Off? Hai. Yes, sir. It's off. Sir, I think you are presenting from, uh, from mobile, na, sir? Yeah, I am presenting. Actually okay, okay. Then, then, uh, then, then video will be not uh, not come. Then uh, the slides will be come at a time. No, it's fine then, sir. Uh, let your slide slide come first. First time. Okay, just a minute. I have done something. Yes. Uh, sir, or else you can mail me your presentation. We will uh, sure. we will share from here. Wait a minute. 
my slide is visible yes sir yes yeah visible yeah start i welcome all the participants and eminent speakers in post lunch session now i invite our next speaker dr mgh reddy professor department of chemistry gb pant university of agriculture and technology pant nagar for his key not lecture on green material science perspectives of processing fabrication and waste management dr zaidi is the physical chemist educator inventor and academic administrator he has been serving gb pant university of agriculture and technology uttarakhand india since 1998 dr zaidi has availed funding from drdo air force research development board dbd dst csir and many other funding agencies for execution and dissemination of r&d in polymer science and technology his area of interest involve synthesis and processing of polymer materials for various applications including disposal of polymeric industrial and agricultural waste to microbial degradation and their utilization into value added products and their impact on ecosystem his academic contributions are cited in reputed journals uh, across the world he has associations with professional scientific societies as member fellow and honorary fellow he holds six patents under research publications reviews monographs and book chapters in referred international journals and scientific magazines now i request dr zaidi to begin with his presentation thank you sir for my very nice present for my very nice introduction uh, first of all <laughs> i would like to express my deep uh, reverence and gratitude to rani lakshmi bai university of agriculture and technology particularly to those who are the organizers of this prestigious event on nanotechnology and my best friend and colleague early colleague uh, dr anil gupta uh, he has been professor in my university and right now he is serving for your university but you know uh, regarding dr anil gupta we are in association since 1998 when i joined dv pant university as assistant professor then he was associate professor and from that time to till date we are academically associated uh, you know to uh, to express and to think that i am working with a very great scientist that that is dr anil gupta he has been inspiration academic so uh, this remark i would like to uh, share my first slide that is uh, we are suffering a lot of challenges in our society we are in energy crisis we are suffering from bad quality water in uh, suffering from you know the food with not only bad quality but with less or insufficient quantity to serve the society pollution is a very big problem there are many type of pollutions we came across in our daily life and we suffer from that our nation is a developing nation so ultimately poverty is a very big issue for that eco friendly and cost effective materials are required to develop the society and to foster the society for their food and comfort terrorism and war is a very key issue of india why because we are surrounded by three different type of territories wherein we are in continuous threat for war and terrorism so ultimately we are in need of uh, eco friendly and good quality weapons good quality materials that can be utilized to design the effective weapons for our safety disease is also a problem because of our you know pollution gradual increase in pollution or you can say that pollution explosion has raised the problem of the country at many fronts out of it disease is one of the problem uh, recently we have faced from very disastrous disease that is a viral disease that is corona virus so ultimately uh, we are we are in need of uh, you know uh, uh, good quality uh, apron good quality protector good quality gloves good quality ppe kits that is actually coming from you know that can be derived from polymer based materials so in this way Uh, uh, our material science is fostering our society in many ways to um, to nature as well as society uh, education is also a very important issue in our india uh, for that the uh, study materials particularly papers plastics and other kind of you know study objects are basically designed through integration of various kind of 
polymers materials and various kind of composite materials so ultimately uh, there are a few seven to eight key issues for our uh, society and not only for our society but also for humanity and this may lead up to next 50 years this is the statement top challenges to the humanity for the next 50 years is actually the statement of the richard smalley who is the nobel laureate in chemistry from rice university in 1996 he got nobel prize for discovery of a very fantastic very uh, you know brilliant molecule that is known as fullerene and that has given a very important breakthrough in the development of you know nanotechnology so there are many people here many will be well known about nanotechnology and maybe doing uh, their experimental and theoretical practices also in the field of nanotechnology but here you see that nanotechnology is basically the joint venture of biology chemistry and physics and as well as engineering there are many fields of the nanotechnology that are being generated or being produced through various permutation and combinations of the various fields of the basic sciences to applied sciences as well as engineering for example you know uh, if you are going uh, to develop some sort of you know uh, transmission uh, transmission systems or some sort of you know protective systems some sort of coatings some sort of biological systems some sort of you know uh, energy energy development or energy conservation systems we are interested in developing some sort of you know uh, sensors uh, for biomolecules ultimately we should have a joint venture of all kind of sciences or all kind of people who are dealing with nano science or who are dealing with basic sciences so in this way nano science is actually the hybrid science that is actually played by many other kind of uh, you know uh, academic uh, thoughts all academic thoughts are united into a very hybrid type of you know science that is actually defined as a nano science in pantnagar university our basic research interests are actually in case of uh, polymer materials their polymerization and polymer modification in supercritical fluids this is a very eco friendly way of uh, synthesis of polymeric materials where we are not using any kind of solvents i will show in my next slide that how we execute this phenomena of uh, processing materials in supercritical fluids basically supercritical fluids are the fluids that are actually operated at critical point they are basically the gases that is being transformed into liquid and in that liquid media that serves as a organic solvent we process a kind of material starting from in organic materials to hybrid materials even organic materials and composite materials even you can also modify one polymer into another polymer through implication of supercritical fluids in the same way second our task is advanced materials we are developing very important kind of key advanced materials which are nowadays under current industrial and civilian practices for example first kind of material is a polymer nano composite or nano hybrid here we are developing these kind of materials from green resources for structural and design engineering purposes nano biotechnology is also one of the area wherein i am associated and this area is actually in the field of uh, development of antimicrobial materials and sustained delivery systems and biosensing in the same way solid state electronics is uh, also one of our area where we are dealing with energy conservation and storage we are developing devices we are we are investigating various kind of electrode materials for super capacitor applications in batteries and fuel cells and in case of multifunctional coatings we are developing some sort of you know heat and corrosion resistant coatings with high electrical conductivity and thermal conductivities nano hazard is also one of our area where we study the implication of uh, uh, nano materials in crops and uh, over crops and animal systems and we investigate their cytotoxicity here we are actually associated with the department of molecular biology and genetic engineering with dr uh, sandeep arora who is actually um, assisting us for uh, uh, nano hazard measurements and nano toxicity evaluations for various kind of plants and animal systems in animal system we are also associated with uh, our uh, college of veterinary sciences where we study the effect of nano particles on animal systems particularly uh, in perspective of their cytotoxicity measurements where we study blood serum profiles uh, 
histo hematological hematological parameters histo pathological parameters in the same way on crops we actually study biotic and abiotic stress uh, imposed by nano materials on plant system so here we actually investigate apx activity gpx activity and many other kinds of malin and the height content and many other kind of content which are being changed due to implication of the plant implication of the nano particle or plant species that is being regulated through reactive oxygen species formation in the same way waste management is also one of our area of interest where we investigate biodegradation of uh, uh, xenobiotic materials for example plastics plastics are recalcitrant they are not easily removable uh, they are not easily removed from our you know environment so we have uh, we have investigated some sort of microbial consortia the of uh, gram negative bacteria for example e coli acinetobacter enterobacter mycobacterium tubercular and many other kind of you know bacteria stains we have developed some sort of powdered consortia and we got us patent also in this field so uh, we apply this uh, consortia to plastic materials in a pit system and we have uh, successfully biodegraded a number of uh, xenobiotic materials number of the recalcitrant plastics out of which polythene is uh, our main interest and we have tried to biodegrade polythene up to more than 30% and we have achieved at least 3 to 4 patents in the area out of it two, two patents are additional and that that are in the process of you know file uh, process of granting so biocomposite is also one of our area where we are utilizing the renewable resources such as uh, biomass uh, to transform them into uh, high performance composite structures through blending with some sort of biodegradable polymer through cross linking through compression molding through heat processing or through some sort of chemical treatment uh, yeah. here in we have also we have also uh, uh, tried to resolve the uh, resolve the issue of paralysis stubble that is a big problem to our farmers we are nowadays trying to transform this stubble into some sort of value added product that can be utilizable by society so uh, computational methods in process optimization is also one of our area of uh, research wherein we develop theoretical models for industries uh, to uh, to develop the processes that can be utilized further experimentally so in this way this also provide a very rapid and clear simplification of the industrial processes that is actually being developed at experimental level through these theoretical data first of all i would like to introduce materials materials are the part and parcel of our society since inception of life see we are the human we have three different kind of civilizations and all these three different civilizations are actually named uh, according to materials our ceramic age civilization or clay based civilization which is also known as stone age then brass age then steel age and then polymer age and nowadays the age of nano technology so nano material polymer steel brass clay ceramics all are materials so in this way human being is practicing nano materials or human being is practicing material science particularly since inception of life see around 55 million years back gorillas chimps and orangutans were in our you know the earth Uh, they were uh, they were in our earth and they were actually uh, concentrated around the ethiopian region and in the, uh, some 2.083 million years back uh, biotechnology reported first origin of y chromosomal adam y chromosomal adam and in 1.700 million years back mitochondrial eve was uh, was investigated by biotechnologists that actually uh, that actually provide the glimpses of the uh human um, human uh, being in our uh, you know in our nature in our on our earth uh, around some 2.5 to 2 million years years ago a stone age was there and where stone tools were developed in africa and israel they have successfully developed uh, uh, blades um, blades and uh, they have developed you know some sort of javelins and some sort of other kind of tools for their shelter for their protection fire and charcoal and charred wood that were actually came into being some around uh, 1.6 million years ago and wooden huts were first uh, appeared in shishibao in japan 
in the same way spheres development of spheres were around some 4 million years back some 2.8 million years back stone bladders and grinders were developed by ethiopians and uh, around some 1.4 million years back some long distance trade were started and uh, were uh, the, the shifting or the intermixing of the culture from one region to another region the kind of the material which are being uh, present from one region was transported to another region in the way, in the same way in the way the society were got amalgamated with each other and they have no how is going our earth and in the same way long distance trade was developed and then there after 1.4 million years back ostrich egg shells that were the first creation of material science that were actually developed by human being and that ostrich egg shells were uh, used for making of beads and jewelries so in the same way the concept of decoration or women decoration came into being through uh, ostrich egg shells they have transformed this ostrich egg shells into different kind of articles that can be utilizable uh, that can be utilized as jewelries so in this way the uh, uh, material science has been grown since billions of years of back from 5005 years ago end of the stone age was there and there is a dawn of the bronze age where uh, copper and tin based materials were prepared and uh, these are actually prepared in some regions of the indus civilization as well as sumerian civilization uh, so where is the uh, sumerian civilization is somewhat older than the indus civilization around some 5 year 500 years back but both civilizations are at par almost and basic uh, crux was actually appeared in the area of uh, technology when uh, uh, abraham darbe has uh, devised a blast furnace that was actually utilized for uh, manufacturing of steel at very large stage around 1876 to 1926 christian era so development of the blast furnace has transformed the whole you know technological developments developments into new era of uh, metal based technology and this has actually promoted our industrial aspect of the material science in a very great way see here adding of rubber with sulfur nowadays we know this phenomena is vulcanization because we are all we always use tires in our bikes in our cars where vulcanization is a very important process vulcanization means rubber has some sort of unsaturation some sort of carbon carbon double bonds through which sulfur attached and it makes rubber to be harder so this phenomena of vulcanization was very much old and it was investigated in 1851 celluloid was uh, uh, celluloid was uh, discovered by alexander parks in 1862 and this celluloid at that time was a very important material that was used for development of the films and coatings and uh, in the same way cellulose nitrate was the first material that was actually developed by uh, uh, developed in uh, uh, developed by henry becknot in 1868 through nitration of cellulose later on cellulose was combined with camphor to form polyjuan polyjuan was a very uh, tough material that material was used for uh, making of the sheets and other kind of bottles and uh, articles there were several type of articles are reported in the literature made up of celluloid for example celluloid for example pens and combs were first developed by celluloid materials next bakelite bakelite is a phenol formaldehyde resin that was actually developed by leo bakelin in 1909 and that was the first synthetic plastic nowadays uh, still bakelite is under practice uh, for our domestic applications so uh, and uh, day by day bakelite is actually replaced by acrylics which are actually used in our switchboards in our electricity so polymerization was developed in the meanwhile as a addition polymerization by stardinger in 1920 where the concept of chemistry of addition of molecules into giant into formation of the giant micromolecular structure came into being around 1920 and from that the chemistry of the polymer at laboratory scale was very much intensified and it was intensified in such a way to such a extent that human being has discovered polyester in 1930 and that was commercialized by dupont polyethylene terephthalate which is a pet nowadays pet is our uh, is a very important material that is one of the important uh, you know uh, material for uh, preparation of you know jar and containers that are very much frequently used in our kitchen so that is a trans 
transparent plastic material in which we uh, contain many of our edible items, when we, we, we store many of our edible items. In the same way, thermoplastic polyester were developed in 1970, and nowadays the thermoplastic polyesters are very important component for development of our many of the plastic based materials. First car bumper was prepared by polypropylene in 1978, and nowadays many of the car bumpers are fabricated from epoxy based coatings or epoxy based materials, wherein epoxy is blended with graphite and some. Acrylic is also blended in order to improve the improve the impact resistance of you know car bumper. But first car bumper was prepared from polypropylene. In the same way, neoprene and nylons were developed by Carothers in 1930. Polyethylene was developed by through some accidental uh, research of Thevitt and Gibson, where they were actually investigating the solubility of various kind of you know gases in organic solvent. And later on, some accident take place. And ultimately, bottle or cage in which they have developed, they have dissolved, you know, gases uh, was broken, and polymerization reaction takes place that was actually transformed into sheet like structure. At that time, Professor Herman Mark and their student David and Gibson were in a very much great confusion that how, how saturated atoms are combined to form the molecule, and what about their degree of saturation? Because in chemistry, we always teach that an atom. If atom shares with another atom, if it has completed its octet, that it cannot be shared with another, chemically shared with another. But here in the double bonded ethylene were converted into polyethylene or in a giant molecule through sharing of their pi linkages. And in this way, a giant micromolecular structure was produced. That was actually the polyethylene. So, uh, this is what the way through which polythene was discovered. And later on, after discovery of polythene, a series of polythene-like structures, particularly acrylate, for example, you know, the uh, polymethyl methacrylate, polybutyl acrylate, polyvinyl chloride, or similar kind of, you know, structures were developed. And uh, polystyrene was very much important material at that time. Uh, and it was introduced uh, by Dow in the United States in 1938. And nowadays, the polythene, uh, polystyrene is used for a variety of applications in packaging, as well as in polystyrene foam based you know, cups in which we always, we sometimes drink our tea and uh, water. So LDP was developed in 1942. LDP is low density polyethylene and LLDP is linear low density polyethylene. These materials are highly recalcitrant and non-biodegradable. They were, they were came into being um, in 1942 uh, and for 1978 and are nowadays a big problem to our environment. They are big threat to our environment because they are non-biodegradable. They, they are actually trapped in our environment and they uh, leave some sort of uh, plasticizer, some sort of you know additive to our environment that actually pollute our uh, soil, our water, and many other, you know, living system. So this is not a very troublesome problem about these uh, non-biodegradable plastics. And uh, we, have, uh, we have successfully uh, established the process of biodegradation of these kind of materials. I will show you in our uh, front slides. Uh, even nylon. Nylon was uh, investigated by Prothers and polyamide and uh, liquid crystalline polymers are a very good invention uh, uh, where, wherein these materials are utilized for you know, defense applications. In the same way, polystyrene toy uh, shark was first uh, proposed by Utah, United States in 1950. That was the first kind of plastic toy that was having a movable jaw. So in this way, polymer has attracted to society our society has been attracted towards polymer or polymeric material to a very great zeal. Why? Because of their lightweight structure, because of their, you know, uh, uh, colorable structures, they are colored into various kind of, you know, objects and uh, they are actually utilized in many ways, but they are very much disastrous to our society. Carbon nanostructure is the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, climax of uh, material science. Uh, where a series of the carbon nanomaterials were discovered out of, out of which fullerene is a very important and next one is carbon nanotube and there are a series of carbon nanostructures and these carbon nanostructures are very important nowadays in our modern society, particularly in development of the sensors, in development of heat resistant coatings, 
in development of high impact materials as well as some sort of carbon nano structures also promote biodegradability of the plastics we have uh, reported uh, the uh, acceleration of uh, uh, biodegradation of polyethylene through addition of trace amount of fluorine 60 what we have uh, we have studying biodegradation of uh, polyethylene and polypropylene and we found that uh, biodegradation process was very slow and ultimately because of uh, because uh, plastics are being used, serve as a carbon source for bacteria so ultimately plastic uh, when plastic material is there then bacterial growth was intensified but in that particular case bacterial growth was not very much fine so we tried to add up some sort of carbonaceous nano structure and i suggested to my uh, one of my colleague dr rita goel why not we try to increase the carbon content of uh, you know broth so uh, so we decided to add up some sort of nano material so what we find that when we added carbon nano tube bacteria were killed because carbon nano tube was found cytotoxic to bacteria but when we added fluorine carbon 60 it is a bucky ball shaped nano structure bacterial growth was tremendously improved and ultimately this was also uh, uh, this was also in a way to degrade our polythene from large uh, macromolecular structure of 10 is power four dalton molecular weight down to 10 to the power two dalton molecular weight within 24 hours under laboratory conditions in broth so i will show you this slide later on here is fullerene fullerene is a very important material that was discovered in 1985 by robert krull robert krull and harold proto and richard smalley these uh, three were responsible for you know uh, fullerene discovery uh, they actually used smalley's apparatus that was smalley's furnace in this furnace there was a rotating graphite disc and uh, this furnace was connected with helium so Uh, and the yag laser or ruby laser or dye laser or any other form of energetic laser was coming uh, from upward and they were interacting with this uh, rotating graphite disc in uh, disc in helium environment and what happened after some after some uh, times after some times what happened this rotating disc was actually decomposed and this kind of soot material this is what you see this kind of soot material was actually developed and within the soot material Uh, some component of the soot material was actually soluble in toluene so when they extracted the soot material with toluene and then they have investigated their uh, uh, their nature through uh, reverse phase splc in water as to nitrile medium then they found that there, are, there was a new kind of graphitic material which was actually in some other shape uh, later on the shape of this material was uh, investigated and established by various kind of spectroscopic methods for example uh, raman spectra laser raman spectra as well as carbon 13 nmr spectroscopy and many other uh, techniques through which uh, they found that carbon uh, which was in the form of the graphite that is lamellar structure this is the lamellar graphite that was transformed into fullerene and nowadays fullerenes uh, starting from 12 uh, 20 carbon atoms to more than 1500 more than 1500 carbon atoms are nowadays well known and they are and the practice for various kind of electronic applications various kind of electrochemical applications also in the same way second type of carbon allotrope was uh, carbon nano tube and carbon nano fiber they are rolled carbon nano structures they are rolled kind of the graphite rolled sheets of the graphite if graphite sheet is rolled into a single concentric cylinder this is known as single walled carbon nano tube which is rolled into multiple Uh, you know walls it is known as multi walled carbon nano tube single sheet of the graphite is known as graphene in the same way amorphous carbon and carbon nano cone and carbon nano horns are also uh, the carbonaceous nano materials which are being developed from discoveries of these kind of you know laser based experiments this is what the nanotechnology milestone in 1974 first molecular electronic device patent was filed in 1891 a scanning coloring microscope was invented in 1985 bucket ball was discovered by richard smale and their two colleagues in 1986 atomic force microscope is invented nowadays we are uh, using atomic force microscope i am very much frequent user of atomic force microscope where you can uh, uh, image all kind of materials from 2d to 3d uh, and give us very important aspect of the morphology roughness as well as uh, you know size 
aspect of nano material their aspect ratios their hardness everything is there uh, their nano mechanical systems the nano indentation is a very good method through which we can investigate three dimensional structure of uh, nano materials or distribution of nano materials into polymer matrix what is their trend how much is kind of qualitative distribution so all these things are basically uh, parameters are basically investigated through atomic force microscope then single electron transistor was created in 1991 by united states in 1993 first designer protein was created this is the matter of biotechnology 1997 carbon nanotubes were discovered by ejima and they were actually discovered they have discovered carbon nanotube because i told you that the yield of the carbon nano yield of fullerene was not very much high in case of you know laser ablation method so they have tried to increase the yield of carbon nanotube and they have uh, practiced laser ablation in presence of some transient metal catalyst so transient metal catalyst has transformed uh, graphitic structure to straight forward into Uh, you know tubular structure of the carbon nanotube so in this way this is accidental discovery wherein people were trying to investigate how to improve the yield of fullerene in laser ablation through catalytic methods so they tried to catalyze uh, the production of the fullerene but fullerene production was not catalyzed except a new kind of carbon nano material was developed by uh, by some uh, ejima in uh, japan in 2000 dna based nano mechanical creation was developed in the same way in 2001 molecular scale computer switch was created so this is what you know a very brief overview of the success of the nano technology for our society see we have developed a lot of materials starting from plastics to nano materials i have i have narrated a very simple journey in within three slides about man how they have developed various kind of materials starting from egg shell material and stone based material ceramic materials to metals and alloys and then you know polymers and plastic and finally uh, human society or investigations are converged into advanced materials also a very good engineer and this is the question do we compete our nature in material science see there are so many beautiful kind of structure being created by our nature that still we cannot create corals corals are very beautiful object of the nature you cannot find any industry in our whole earth who have developed the fabrication of shankar coral and if you are uh, trying to develop or trying to fabricate a plastic based device of this kind ultimately this will not give you such kind of ultrasonics as we achieve the ultrasonic through blowing of shank in the same way rudraksh rudraksh see how kind of carving is there and uh, there is no machine uh, there is no mechanical device but you know nature has created by itself in the same way cellulosic materials see you cut uh, you cut the stem of a tree you find that how much fine grains of you know uh, lignin and cellulose based blend is there in the same way uh, phenomena of wetting is one of very important aspect of our nature uh, synthesis of colors in our uh, plants and uh, in our you know uh, various kind of animal systems is uh, very uh, marvelous and through which we have actually learned how to have, we have learned the color combination and see here uh, how much earth is uh, beautiful uh, with multi colored you know objects if you, if you see if you see a garden Uh, in a very keen way you will see that there are multi colors and all these colors are blended in a very beautiful way that actually give comfort to our eyes so in this way nature is also marvelous and nature is doing very good kind of engineering that we cannot compete so we have uh, transformed our material up to atomic and nano level but still there are many things wool we have developed synthetic wool but here you know that cashmilon is okay that is a synthetic wool but everybody wants to wear the garment in our winters from pure wool everybody when going to purchase wool we ask is it it is uh, pure wool or synthetic wool so what is there because we know that pure wool is a very good kind of you know textile that is uh, uh, that is give us very good comfort good comfort as well as you know good warmth in comparison to cashmere see in the list of technological developments We have spoiled the nature. So, due to the lapervai, se 50,000 logo ka jivan muskil. Rapid industrialization. What has done? Rapid industrialization has done 
a lot of pollution this boy is searching somewhat what is what what is searching this boy this boy is surrounded with many kind of waste plastic products that are not being utilized by our society that are very much toxic to our environment in the same way toxic materials toxic uh, you know effluents coming from industries uh, is a big problem that is uh, in 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 our village many of the industries are there from that toxic uh, you know effluents are coming and farmers use this toxic effluent for development of for cultivation of uh, you know our uh, uh, vegetables and crops and that comes into the market we don't know that how much toxic effluent is used for their irrigation but still this is a big problem because water is a big problem how we can purify the water see here laboratory accidents are very common durability of material is not much fine uh, our uh, our uh, you know army is in need of uh, durable weapons but materials are not very much good to uh, to develop the durable weapons in the same way helmets helmets are very important you know uh, uh, object uh, for drivers uh, without uh, without this helmet device we cannot uh, save our heads so ultimately uh, we are in need of uh, materials that must be very much sturdy for helmet production in the same way our sleepers sleepers in, are in need of rubber that must be wear resistant we ultimately dispose of a sleeper after wearing for over for example one year or two year tires Uh, we we continuously are in process of replacement of our tires uh, uh, for at least after one year or two year why because uh, because uh, rubber is not much wear resistant so there is a need to develop the wear resistant materials in the same way mobile phones mobile phones are mostly uh, associated with accidents uh, there is a recommendation that don't talk over mobile when it is under charging state what is there why because of accidental situation batteries are not well functioning in lithium ion battery nowadays backup backup is of uh, energy storage is not more than 746 farad per gram but here in we have developed some sort of materials uh, that have more than 2000 farad per gram of the uh, you know backup backup i will tell you i will tell you i will show you the next slide corrosion is a big problem in the same way artificial implants is a big problem Uh, we are not having good quality of artificial implant or we are having if some good quality of artificial implant ultimately the cost of the implant is very much higher so ultimately these are social problems and through which we can utilize material science and nanotechnology through joint venture of our physicist chemist and biologist uh, to develop novel class of materials that support to our society particularly farmers and poors to uh, to lead their cozy and comfort life failure we are now still in this century again we discuss about failure failed uh, this is bill gates who says that i failed in some subjects in exam but my student passed in all now he is an engineer in microsoft and i am the owner of the microsoft so failure doesn't mean that we are failed if there is a failure ultimately we can get a jump towards higher quantum state to get the success michael faraday was a very good scientist he has worked in many of the field electromagnetic induction is also one of the field he was taking a coil and a magnet and ultimately he was playing coil and a magnet and there was no deflection nowadays uh, through michael faraday's electromagnetic induction uh we have a device that is known as transformer in transformer there are two coils first is primary and other is secondary uh, from that flux is transformed and the and the electrical flux and magnetic flux are coherently interact and then finally they produce uh, electricity so uh, uh, they actually uh, um, boost up the voltage and in this way we get electricity so there is what a question of sustainability in the failure is the best friend why because without failure we cannot live So ultimately, material failure is also our good inspiration through which we try to develop good quality of materials. So sustainability is very important. We are in need of sustainable processes from renewable resources. We should how to utilize renewable resources. How we can reduce the cost of production. How we can reduce the cost of damages. How we can reduce the resources of damages, particularly disposal of solvent. or gases to environment in the same way uh, our product is how much commercially viable 
as well as what kind of business opportunities will be there in terms of the buyer and transfer of technology. This is a map that is showing uh, sustainability issue at various part of you know nation, various part of our country, uh, of our world. For example, some there is somewhat four percent of sustainability. There is somewhat nineteen percent of sustainability. So ultimately, sustainability is a very important issue. Sustainability of industry is very important issue, and that issue is actually regulated through processes. What kind of processes should be developed that can deliver the materials at a very low cost, utilize more and more uh, renewable resources, more and more you know the uh, non-toxic uh, resources, and their uh, the disposal of the materials should also be very much good in terms of the. Uh, environmental issue particularly when these two material uh, these two material, these materials should not create any kind of pollution to our environment here is we have developed a kind of method wherein we use uh, wherein we develop materials without using any solvent so this is actually a solvent less technology what we do we actually take some sort of gases uh, we purchase gases and then we compress the gases into closed high pressure reactor vessel and at some temperature and pressure gases are then compressed and heated they are liquefied and under this liquid state of the gases we utilize this liquid state as a solvent for chemical processing this kind of phenomena is known as liquefaction phenomena when a gas is heated from gases state to liquid uh, gases state uh, under pressure gas is liquefied and this kind of gas this kind of uh, you know point wherein the gas is liquefied is defined as a critical point when a gas is operated above critical point there is no further liquefaction in the gas except at higher pressures and temperatures what the material which is being dissolved in the gas is actually solubilized and through tuning up the pressure and temperature of the gas you can also tune up the solubility of the material as well as reactivity or chemistry operating within the material for example if you want to make a material to be biodegradable let us suppose that polyethylene is not biodegradable we know that if we blend polyethylene with cellulose because cellulose is biodegradable and we are in uh, we are interested in developing some sort of you know fabric for, to development of the biodegradable bags for our uh, daily use from market uh, for applications in market we so uh, we can easily develop through blending this uh, kind of plastic with the uh, you know uh, uh, biodegradable polymer but it is very difficult to blend uh, you know cellulose or it is very difficult to blend for example bagas with the uh, uh, plastic material so ultimately if we blend these two kind of materials into liquid carbon dioxide because liquid carbon dioxide is a very good solvent for for polyethylene and polypropylene when we treat polyethylene or polypropylene with liquid carbon dioxide liquid carbon dioxide is almost swollen and under high pressure if we blend this uh, bagas particles or bagas powder or any other biodegradable substrate into liquid carbon dioxide medium into polypropylene or polyethylene ultimately all of the bagas will be mixed with the uh, you know polyethylene or polypropylene if you try to mix this in a some organic solvent for example some hexane or benzene or toluene we have to heat up a lot and through heating a 500 watt of heater will be required for two hour heating three hour heating too much electricity consumption will be there but here in this process there is no electricity consumption simply we charge our reactor with carbon dioxide and we chill with water through tap water we chill it and ultimately we slightly heat up to 50 to 60 degree too much liquefaction of carbon dioxide is there because critical point of carbon dioxide is 31.5 degree celsius at 32 atmospheres so ultimately Uh, if we are having the temperature of the carbon dioxide from 35 to 60 ultimately too much liquid carbon dioxide is produced and that act as a solvent and in that solvent media we can develop a lot of composite materials of different kind of you know applications earlier carbon dioxide was used for sterilization and for plant extraction that is why here i have told you some slides uh, on the slide some figures related to dna Um, uh, interaction of the dna with carbon dioxide so carbon dioxide in super critical state interacts with dna and ultimately uh, the system is sterilized through breaking of these kind of you know bond associated with dna in the same way carbon dioxide is also used for making nanoparticles 
through spraying technique you know people uh, many of the people across the country and the world are actually developing uh, nano particles somebody is preparing copper nano particles some is preparing gold some is preparing silver you know laboratory practices are not fine to develop a nano particle system or a nano collide system with reproducible size we have, we were having a project from biotechnology wherein we were interested in developing antimicrobial nano composites uh, and we were working with a very brilliant biotechnologist of a very brilliant uh, you know microbiologist of our university she has a lot of you know the, uh, uh, publications in good microbiology journals uh, and uh, Uh, we both were puzzled why because uh, my student was developing some sort of nano material it was giving some for example uh, 2.8 mm zone of inhibition with e coli at the same time same material was developed again through same protocol zone of inhibition was not reproduced again the zone of inhibition was either less or more why because in laboratory practices if we are preparing nano particles then it is good they can be utilizable for physical means for physical uh, kind of research for, for physical research but sometimes they are not suitable for biological research because biological research research in biology is very delicate than the research in physical sciences so, uh, however anyway we are nowadays using supercritical carbon dioxide in processing polymerization reinforcement blending extrusion forming micronization means nanoparticle preparation impregnation means impregnation of nanoparticle into polymer products and purification when carbon dioxide interacts with polymers carbon dioxide imparts swelling that changes into physical structure of the uh, polymeric structure along with mechanical properties and ultimately when we depressurize carbon dioxide return to atmospheric pressure either materials are extracted from carbon dioxide or formed if carbon dioxide is very much affinitive towards material or material is much much and more soluble in carbon dioxide ultimately it leads to forming and fracture but if material is not much soluble ultimately it leads to the phenomena of extraction this is our reactor system that we use in our laboratory this is the actual model of uh, actual you know uh, machine of the reactor this is fully pid controlled uh, dr anil gupta is uh, well known about this kind of device because he is also having some sort of super critical reaction system there in our dv pant university that is very good in functioning state so here uh, there is a vessel this vessel is actually connected with dynamic mechanical mixture this vessel is having three different kind of you know uh, inlets uh, three different kind of connectivity or out which two is actually for inlet and one is for outlet carbon dioxide or nitrogen is fed into the vessel which is fully steered and ultimately this vessel is connected with the pressure gauge as well as uh, thermocouples that gives us inner and outer temperature of uh, the system and this whole category this whole system is actually uh, uh, regulated through pid control system here is a pid that is also we are looking and with the steering system that is a uh, tachometer that is actually connected with this uh, device and that actually used for steering so uh, we have developed a lot of materials this is uh, this is the literature since 2011 but now it is 2021 so this is just illustration we we have uh, published more than more than 100 publications in this area uh, so we have uh, we have uh, investigated uh, blending of polypropylene with the uh, ferrite nanoparticles polypropylene is actually blended with ferrite ferrite are the iron oxide and blending of polypropylene with ferrite give us the material that is very important for uh, development of uh, biosensors as well as uh, development of magnetic devices in the same way polyacrylic acid was blended with uh, fullerene 60 Uh, or polymethyl methacrylate was blended with fullerene 60 so the material which was blended uh, uh, through the, which was prepared through blending of polyacrylic acid with fullerene 60 is actually serving as a poly electrolyte for photovoltaic cells in the same way poly pmma 60 is also the material that is actually used for anti refractive type of coatings in the same way epoxy and ferrite were successfully blended uh, 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 to develop the polymer nano composites and these materials are very much used as electrical inductors in the same way polyvinyl propylene polyvinyl pyridine and carbon 60 was blended uh, and this material is also used for variety of industrial and even biomedical application because polyvinyl pyridine and polyvinyl pyridone has some sort of biomedical application this is not a layout uh, through which you can understand 
what kind of parameters are involved in supercritical processing of nanomaterials. We can variate to vinyl pyridine. For example, this is the case of polyvinyl pyridine ferrites. This uh, paper is published in Fullerene Nanotube and Carbon Nanostructure earlier. Uh, this journal was actually, sometimes it was uh, deal by Richard Smale, who is the inventor of Fullerene. But nowadays, uh, he is not dealing with particular. This journal is very reputed uh, from Taylor Francis. So uh, we can, uh, we can uh, regulate uh, the parameters of the concentration, pressure, and temperature. And through that, we can get a lot of, you know, uh, materials of good structures and uh, well-defined structures and good uh, thermal and electrical and, you know, the electrochemical properties also. Here, you can see that uh, through this uh, uh, strategic reaction at various parameters, we were successfully uh, uh, connected a micromolecular chain with the fullerene. And this is not a one chain. This is actually uh, uh, some six, seven to eight chains that are actually connected with the central fullerene, central bucky structure, and it behaves like a nano star structure, wherein fullerene is a central part or core part of the system, and polymers are of different chain length are attached with the sp2 carbon of the fullerene uh, that is actually uh, appearing in the form of you know. Uh, the star-like structure. We have also investigated laser-induced breakdown spectra of these materials. Nowadays, this laser-induced breakdown spectra, uh, this facility is available with uh, Dr. Raudhesh Kumar Rai uh, from Allahabad University in the Department of Physics. So uh, we have uh, utilized uh, their expertise in this, and we find that what kind of atomic lines are there available in fluorine, and ultimately we compared these atomic lines with the atomic lines that were investigated uh, by Richard Ismale, the Nobel laureate, who have done work in the area. And we find that the, what the finding of the Nobel laureate, that is Richard Ismale, was uh, our finding was a closed agreement with the findings of the Richard Ismale. So in this way, we have established this star-like structure of fullerene polyvinyl pyridine composites. Here is the development of polymer blend. We know that one polymer cannot be blended into another because polymers have relative immiscibility over each other. So through this technique, we have successfully blended epoxy with polymethyl methacrylate at a pressure of supercritical carbon dioxide. And these materials are, no, you know, these materials are also biodegradable. Uh, these materials are biodegradable because we have investigated the biodegradability of epoxies and epoxy thermoplastic blends. And we find that many of microbes, for example, uh, Stingobacterium, Acinetobacter, and Mycobacterium, they are actually mixed in some sort of consortia, and that consortia is very much effective for biodegradation of these materials. So these materials are very good in terms of biodegradability as well as high mechanical strength. These materials are of high mechanical strength. They are having high tensile strength, high, uh, high hardness, high wear resistance. They are high impact strength. They are high uh, compressive strength. All these parameters are good. On the same way, these materials are biodegradable. So ultimately, these kind of approaches not only uh, provide a material of high performance structures or high performance nature, but also disposable materials by our environment. This is the way of polymer engineering. This is the slide just for beginners. See, the first kind of polymer composite was developed by Charles McIntosh, who was actually having a layer of the rubber that was uh, compressed with the two or sandwiched with two, you know, grape, uh, sandwiched two cotton fabric. In this way, mats were developed, and at that time, mats were of great use. And you know, the first uh, glider that was developed by Alville at Bulwell Wright, that was uh, the glider that was having such kind of mats. So uh, uh, these are the compression molded structures, and compression molding is basically done in a compression molding machine, wherein uh, we use matrix, we use reinforcement. We use some sort of moldings, some, some sort of compounding practices, as well as cast preparation. And after that, we extract out the material or we take out the material and then finally we subject it to finishing. This is the commercial uh, compression molding system. See, and he, here these are, you know, the, our pens and pencils and many other things which are nowadays coming in, in the market in the form of, compo uh, in the form of compression molded structures. The extrusion is also the phenomena wherein we mix matrix and reinforcement 
into a twin or multiple type of exclusion or single to a single exclusion system uh, where a single barrel is there or multiple barrel is there ultimately on heating material is fused at glass transient temperature and finally it is uh, transformed into composite structure and that composite structure then compression molded into various kind of particles this is a very interesting slide just to demonstrate uh, how epoxies uh, work uh, for development of composite structures see here uh, this is uh, this is the structure of the epoxy or this is epoxy composite which is being derived through blending of epoxy resin commercial epoxy resin which is known as araldite this structure which is given here is actually the structure of the araldite is araldite is cured with uh, polyamine to form a tough structure and when we develop this tough structure in presence of some carbon nano material ultimately carbon nano composite is produced and this carbon nano composite is very sturdy of very high strength as well as it is of good machine ability you can cut this material into any kind of uh, you know shape for example here i have cut this material in the form of the dog bones uh, there are many uh, many of our publications of uh, this kind of you know uh, this kind of development in journal of experimental nano science we have successfully blended epoxy with ferrite materials in carbon letter uh, we have successfully blended the epoxy with multi walled carbon nano tube in defense science journal we have successfully blended single and multi walled carbon nano tube as well as fullerenes as well as materials today proceeding we have uh, we recently we have reported a very fundamental work on how the various kind of compositions of uh, uh, epoxy with carbonaceous nano materials Uh, 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 are required to develop the high performance structures in terms of the tuning of uh, pressure and temperature uh, in the same way in various conferences we have uh, in proceedings we have developed uh, such kind of materials and published this is very interesting example where we have developed biodegradable polymer blends not only biodegradable but also of very great strength uh, this paper is published in international biodegradation and biodegradation Uh, here in we have charged the reactor with the epoxy resin as well as silicone the silicone is a baby oil you know what baby oil we use in our uh, domestic practices simply we have blended the silicone with baby oil and ultimately uh, in li liquid carbon dioxide and ultimately that has given us a very cured material in terms of the epoxy silicone blend see how much fine texture of epoxy silicone blend is appearing whereas cured epoxy and silicone blend has not much difference in you know uh, in the morphology such uh, such identical morphology means uh, you know um, baby oil or silicone oil was fully blendable with epoxy and later on we investigated the mechanical properties of uh, uh, this uh, composite uh, which is being derived at various proportions of silicone oil with epoxy we find that uh, up to 200 to ppm or uh, 200 per 200 uh, you know ppm level uh, mechanical properties of uh, epoxy silicone blend was very much higher but after 200 weight fraction this mechanical property was declined so uh, we have investigated the biodegradability of uh, this uh, um, uh, epoxy silicone blend that was actually prepared at 200 weight fraction of the silicone oil what we find that there was a tremendous Uh, increase in biodegradability of this material this material was found almost biodegradable in our microbial consortia in the same way we have uh, also developed very interesting material and uh, we have published it into e polymer uh, the, that is a very reputed polymer journal uh, journal related to polymer chemistry uh, here in we use uh, we use nylon we use a tire powder you know we if you go to uh, those people who are related with the uh, fabricating tires or development of tires or casting material for tires they have a lot of waste powder of rubber so these this waste rubber powder is very disastrous we many of the people we don't know how much it is cancerous and how much it is it is uh, Uh, creating pollution to our environment so uh, i have been to one tire industry and i observed that there are two kind of materials there one is uh, oil and another one is black colored black colored waste so i asked him that what is this so they told we have no use of it 
ultimately i requested them to please give us these two kind of materials and what we have found we have come to our laboratory we have blended these two kind of materials with various type of polymers and we find that polymers got uh, biodegraded so uh, for that uh, uh, the rubber oil or uh, waste powder is uh, or uh, rubber powder is waste for them but in the same way if you blend these two materials to plastics ultimately you can improve the biodegradability of the plastic so we have done this kind of experiment most of the papers are in the process of publication that is why i have not given you the slide but uh, this uh, uh, rubber waste or uh, rubber oil waste uh, approach is uh, actually based on these two kind of approaches that we have uh, published in african journal of microbiological research and international journal of biodegradation and biodegradation in both cases we have developed the material in the same way we have developed the same kind of material with rubber waste and these rubber waste kind of material is also biodegradable and uh, nowadays since uh, one of our professor who was uh, very much associated with me in the area of microbiology is going is actually retired so ultimately we are not able to have good uh, technical support of uh, you know microbiology particularly uh, in uh, uh, bacteria so ultimately we switch over to enzymatic biodegradation as well as uh, fungal biodegradation so nowadays we are practicing enzymatic and fungal biodegradation of these materials and ultimately we are getting good results this is our one of the patent where we have successfully dispersed in organic material into organic structure because you know organic polymers are non compatible with inorganic material for example you cannot blend talc with polypropylene or polystyrene or polyethylene so here we have uh, uh, developed uh, a composite structure where in uh, the inorganic material was found fully blendable with organic phase so this was the first kind of discovery first kind of you know uh, discovery and uh, never been uh, actually academically appeared in the form of the paper so we uh, we got uh, advantage of filing the patent and this was the first patent of my life through uh, that is actually i have uh, got from uh, from india and nowadays uh, this patent is under pct filing see here cholesterol biosensor we have uh, developed uh, biosensors for a lot of biomolecules for example urea cholesterol uh, cimazine uh, as well as uh, many other uh, herbicides chloropyrifos uh, which is the insecticide and uh, you know 24d we have we have published all that things you go through encyclopedia or go through scholarpedia of my link wherein you can get all the papers so uh, here in we have uh, we have developed a cholesterol biosensor through blending some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, material for example graphite with sulfonated polysulfone and in the nm9 methyl pyridone and ultimately we have developed electrodes and these electrodes uh, were uh, uh, coated with the you know polymer nano composites some sort of polymer nano composites and these polymer nano composites coated electrodes were investigated for biosensing of cholesterol we found that they are showing the excellent biosensing and ultimately uh, material is in the form of the device just it is a 1 cm square shaped electrode and this 1 cm square shaped electrode is reusable electrode just you put into electrochemical device you connect it we take biosensing of cholesterol and ultimately you wash it and you keep it and preserve it for next kind of application so a single kind of electrode we have developed that has been utilized for variety of uh, biomolecules for sensing of variety of biomolecules see here uh, this is sustained drug delivery system that we have developed in the same way uh, we have uh, we have successfully coated hydrogels uh, over uh, magnetic uh, cores and uh, that hydrogels were functional and that uh, functional hydrogels were connected with the uh, you know of the some uh, drug for example here the drug which is shown in a red structure that is actually doxorubicin that is anti cancer drug so uh, hydrogel provides some sort of functionalities that connect uh, the drug molecule and finally when we release into uh, when we when we allow to release the drug into aqueous phase or uh, in uh, in uh, bsa or hsa medium by serum in the serum medium then ultimately these drugs are simply Uh, you know uh, sustain uh, they are sustainable they are uh, they are released through very good sustain action and finally uh, these uh, molecules can be used for drug delivery system this is just sort of you know one kind of you know sample 
we have uh, we have published more than six seven papers here there are there there are three or four papers some more papers are here in this area see here this is enzyme free sensor for fertilizer detection here we have developed some sort of enzyme free detectors where there is no enzyme and uh, uh, because uh, there is a very important uh, there is very important discussion on enzymatic detector so there are too much publications on enzyme based detector for example estine choline stearase is a very important enzyme that is mostly used for biosensing so uh, in the lab in the laboratory we are actually not having enzyme so we switch uh, we switch over to think that whether we can develop some enzyme free uh, electrode system that can sense biomolecule then ultimately we tried uh, so many compositions uh, and we find that polypyrrole which is a conducting polymer if we we decorate graphene oxide which is a uh, graphitic uh, system or graphene like system with oxygen bearing functionality over sp2 carbon these oxygen bearing functionalities are in the form of the hydroxyl or carboxylic or ketonic group so when we attach uh, polypyrrole with these functionalities ultimately there is no need of enzyme uh, to sense the fertilizer even this electrode electrochemically sense the urea this paper is actually uh, enzymatic sensor for urea detection we have uh, employed square wave electro square wave voltammetry to quantify the enzyme uh, quant quantify the uh, quantify the level of the urea that is being detected so we find that ppp level of the urea was detected through this uh, through this enzyme uh, non enzymatic electrode here we are uh, dealing with the multifunctional coatings these multifunctional coatings for electrochemical energy storage as well as for thermal management for heat resistance and uh, for antimicrobial uh, system so we have developed some sort of antimicrobial coatings through blending of uh, antimicrobial nanoparticles with polymer this was our dvt project and in this project uh, we have uh, successfully prepared a series of polymer nano composites that give us a very good antimicrobial resistance up to 72 hours so this is our one of the finding second finding is that this is a finding in the form of the patent we got the patent in 2019 from department of biotechnology now this patent is filed uh, under pct filing it is filed in many of other countries so uh, in the same way we also develop some sort of coatings these coatings are for battery fuel cell applications there are a number of publications you can see here in carbon letters in advanced material letters in material renewable sustainable energy in bulletin of material science carbon letter the international journal of polymer analysis character all are very good reputed journals with good impact factors so here in we have we have tried to develop the carbon based coatings and these carbon based coatings have uh, are showing very good kind of electrochemical energy storage even from lithium ion battery 743 farad per gram we have uh, uh, we have tried to establish uh, the super capacitance of 2080 farad per gram nowadays uh, we are interested in developing the device of this kind of coating so that uh, we can uh, provide a viable substitution viable substitute to the uh, batteries that are being involved in lithium ion batteries this is what uh, our biodegradation scheme biodegrade uh, our uh, you know uh, uh, antimicrobial nano composite system this is sustained re uh, release of antimicrobial nano composite system up to 72 hours this is the wood floor based plastic composite we are here we are utilizing uh, the waste uh, biomass in the form of the wood to develop high performance composite structures simply either we take powders uh, uh, we chemically treat these powders uh, with uh, some cryo milling as well as uh, some ball milling or uh, we we treat uh, this powder with some chemicals to develop the cross link powders and these cross link powders are finally compression molded we can also alternatively prepare this through extrusion because in uh, in our university we have not extrusion facility but we are dealing with uh, some cpet at some place where one person is there they are preparing the extruded materials uh, of uh, wood floor that we have treated through cross linking we have some sort of you know uh, material some sort of polymeric material that we uh, that we treat the wood floor with which we treat the wood floor to develop some sort of usable material that can be easily compression molded into 
uh, into various kind of articles like this. These are the articles that we can produce. So here is uh, a very good, uh, you know, result. See here, solubility and uh, solubility in gram per liter for acetone, for alcohol, uh, all that things uh, with loading of polyacrylonitrile as one of the filler is here. When we load uh, polyacrylonitrile into popular wood floor, what is there? We find that the solubility of uh, popular wood floor into alcohol, benzene, into water, into alkali uh, is dramatically decreased, leading to high strength composite materials. Uh, we, we compress it into composite structure. We find that the tensile and mechanical properties of the composite structure is very much high. So here is another way uh, of, uh, this is also the extended part of this, uh, you know, uh, work where we use uh, uh, wood floor for development of advanced composite structures. We also investigated the biodegradability of the wood floor. Uh, and we find that uh, there was a tremendous reduction in the biodegradability of the material. Means, I mean, in some cases, when we are blending some sort of polymers, for example, uh, for example, polymer derived with epoxy rings, then uh, biodegradability of the wood floor is increased. But if we blend uh, wood floor with uh, you know, thermoplastics, ultimately biodegradability of uh, the final composite structure is reduced. So uh, this is a way how to tune up the biodegradability. Sometimes we are not in need of uh, biodegradability. Sometimes we are in need of fully biodegradability. So ultimately, we are finding the ways through which how we can tune up uh, the biodegradability of the final product through blending uh, wood floor with some sort of polymeric structures. This is a very important issue on which we are nowadays working. Uh, wood is stable. Uh, stable is a very big problem. Uh, and farmers are actually in very great trouble where they should, uh, where they should dispose of this kind of you know, parali or stable. So herein we have find a very ultimate solution of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, utilization of stable into advanced composite structure. See here, recently, this is uh, the work that we have recently done within last one month. So here we have designed a machine. That machine is under the subject of patenting. That uh, machine is actually named as Pant Audyogit Post Subsist Samvardhak, Plant Pant Industrial Solid Base Molder. I have designed this machine. This machine is a very good compatible machine. And uh, after studying more than more than two dozen patents from free patent online and other websites we have downloaded. And then we find that machines which are used for uh, biomass or agro waste treatment are very much complicated. Uh, by the way, I've also studied instrumental engineering. So ultimately I have utilized the knowledge of my instrumental engineering. And we have engineered a very simple portable, this machine, this machine is, already, uh, this machine is hardly of some, you know, three or three point something fits. And this mass of this machine is say some uh, some 18 kg. This is very lightweight machine. So what is my interest? How I how I take an interest in this uh, you know aspect of uh, uh, disposal of stubble? Why? Because uh, you know farmers are uh, in great trouble. Our uh, uh, we want uh, to double the income of the farmer. I say that uh, we have to double the income of the farmer, not, uh, not it is uh, the proper way. We, we should multiply more than double, triple, multiple uh, income to the farmer. So that farmer should be enriched with, uh, and uh, they should have good wealth and good you know, money for their agricultural practices. So they are, uh, they are producing a lot of biomass and for which there is a huge uh, political hue and cry uh, sometimes uh, sometimes government says something to them, they are not agreeing. So ultimately we think that how we can utilize, uh, you know, the, this uh, material. So here in, uh, this is all, you know, the stubble in the different form. This is one kind of stubble, another, another. We have, uh, we have blended some sort of biodegradable material and then we try to shape into some sort of bricks. Here is, this is the, what kind of, uh, you know, bricks and here are the hardboard. We have established these kind of things and now materials are under the process of investigation. I assure you at this forum that there is a time coming then you will definitely see a news in our, on, on our TV channels that we think another has uh, uh, resolved the issue of the Parali in terms of its eco-friendly and value addition product. 
in terms of development of the eco friendly and bio addition product because i have bought something and my one phd student is already working in the area out of the, and two msc students are also assisting them i'm i am also physically present with them uh, uh, to help them and just like a student we are working so ultimately my object is to develop such kind of you know objects uh, not only for uh, farmers but also for industries why because if we are using this waste material from farmer and uh, let us suppose that we are transforming into partition structures or no open by these structures or our furnitures or many other things or even we are using in the form of the bricks uh, for our home or for shelters so these are these are eco friendly and inexpensive in that way we can serve the nation in a very great way and will also help we will also be helpful to farmers this is our one of the work this is these are the some few last slides bacterial gene pool for biodegradation of polymers and plastic waste there are many slides i can brief here in a very simple way we isolate bacteria from soil and then we test the bacteria for its toxicity if bacteria is toxic then ultimately we remove the bacteria if bacteria is non toxic then ultimately we utilize the bacteria for biodegradation so ultimately after toxicity test we select the bacteria and then we make consortia and then after making the consortia we blend plastic material into that consortia and finally we observe that see here we observe that uh, we observe the lambda max because uh, because when uh, when uh, polymer will be utilized by bacteria ultimately the growth of the bacterial phase will be increased uh, will be increased and what happens that is being measured through lambda max so when the log phase is there then ultimately whole of the polymer is utilized by bacteria then after that we isolate polymer from the broth and then we investigate their physical properties see here this is the tga thermogrammetric plot here the polymer which has which is original or control having is showing uh, thermal stability up to 425 degrees celsius but after treating with uh, some sort of consortia which is made up of e coli mycobacterium enterobacter and pseudomonas so uh, this kind of consortia with such kind of stains actually impart Uh, reduction in its uh, onset tg temperature that simply indicates biodegradation here is a non bio a and b these are the non biodegradable plates of the stem and here after some times and here in d after some times with increase in time you see that how biodegradability of material is promoted so here is a absorption versus days uh, diagram uh, so we expose our uh, plastic material for example ldp or any kind of plastic material because it is very difficult to document the type of material you know this is you know we have uh, uh, we have investigated some about more than one dozen plastics we have investigated various grades of polyethylene polypropylene various grades of polycarbonates various grades of polysulfone as well as rubbers as well as epoxies so ultimately uh, it is very difficult to document Uh, all these polymers and their results in a, within one or two slides just we can just you can understand that what we are doing so we record actually the lambda max with time in terms of the days and finally when log phase is appeared then ultimately we isolate the polymer and then we subject to uh, characterization and then finally we find that material is biodegraded or not so after that after laboratory experiment then we Uh, we utilize uh, when we investigate uh, the biodegradation or we establish the biodegradation of these kind of materials in field conditions so we have also developed uh, some some kits there in our college and in that kits we also uh, mix with we also mix consortia with our plastics and ultimately we investigate that what kind of uh, you know biodegradation is going there so uh, so uh, we have uh, we have investigated uh, biodegradation of materials in both kind of ways in the laboratory ways in broth system as well as in our field system in the form of the pits so we 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 have achieved three patents uh, on pit system wherein we have uh, used some tel based formulation that formulation is a very good kind of formulation simply we blend this formulation with plastic and ultimately we 
uh, just subject to pit and we close the pit after 3 to 4 days or 5 days depending on the nature of the plastic that is under subject of biodegradation polythene takes some 28 days that is very 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 difficult to degrade but there are many other polymers uh, that are easily biodegraded for example epoxies are degraded within 3 days you know epoxies are uh, the material that are very much used in our electronic industry as well as in our uh, you know uh, computers all these computers and other kind of objects are made up of some sort of epoxies and some sort of you know, acrylic blend epoxy. So epoxies uh, are very difficult to dispose. For example, most of the e-waste is actually coming in the form of epoxies blend, blended with some sort of acrylics and some sort of pillars. Recently, we have also achieved one patent on biodegradation of e-waste. So here, these are our research projects. We have uh, uh, done a lot of research projects from different kind of industries. This is publication profile. On the last day, 4 October, I was having 1643 citations with uh, 20 H index. These are our author. These are in some news. And in the same way, slide is These are patents. We have patents granted, and there are three more patents which are filed since last one year. This is the news profile, and this is my contact. So, thanks for your listening with patience. And ultimately, I would be happy if there is any question from public. Thank you so much, Hello. sir. For sharing your views on green senses of nanoparticles. You emphasize on milestones achieved in the area of nanosize technology, also unique features of carbon nanotubes and graphene. Although the word nanotechnology is new, but the phenomenon of nanotechnology is old and already existing, itself, as you rightly pointed out, in the form of uh, corals or rocks and was used by ancient India. Your ideas and experience on nano mineral, mineral science, material science will definitely help us us and other parties. Uh, now to keep the memories of this webinar alive forever, sir, please accept a token of love and gratitude from our side. I request Dr. Anil Kumar, sir, Director of Education, to facilitate, facilitate our eminent speaker with a moment. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tanuj? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jaibi, for your nice lecture on the polymer chemistry and how yeah. nanotechnology could be useful in development of many nanopolymers. And uh, I'm sure that uh, your scintillating talk is really helping this uh, party, the participant of this national webinar. I'm sure that many of the participants, they might be interested in your field and they can have discussion with you. You have already shared your email ID as well as the mobile number. And uh, now I am really happy to honor you by giving a, a small token as a memento to you. Please accept, Dr. Jadi. Thank you, sir. Moreover, thank you for calling me to deliver a talk on my area of expertise. Uh, and, uh, we will work uh, with uh, Rani Lashmbai University. We, we, we will be having proud to work with your university. If there is any kind of collaboration, I am available here. Because, it, it will be uh, our pleasure. Will thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, now the session is open for discussion. Uh, any question uh, from the participant side? Please raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, look uh, at the chat box. There are uh, two questions. One by Dr. Seva Nayak uh, from IGFRI Hansi. The nano uh, particle work on plant system temporarily or permanent? Yeah. This is the question, sir. We are working on nano particle systems for plant, but we have bad experience here. What happened? There was my student, 
who are working with me on super critical reaction system is proved was broken she was worried and then i gave her to department of molecular biology and genetic engineering and expressed my request to one of uh, our colleague dr sandeep arora ki yes i am in trouble and you please take my student i have a number of nano particles and i want you test these nano particles whether they are plant growth promotory or not so uh, initial stage at initial stage they have uh, worked on tissue culture uh, medium and they find that gold and silver was very much good for increasing the root and shoot elongation of uh, brassica we were so much happy later on you know we switch over to field experiment was uh, i have given him some 25 liters of silver and gold nano particles you know 25 liters for to hold uh, plant for hold you know field finally brassica was very happy because she was getting gold everybody will be happy to get gold brassica was also happy too much happy to get gold what happened when we collected the seed and we extracted oil from the seed there was a big problem oil was contaminated with ferrite with iron with silver with copper with all kind of nano particles this is what the problem so ultimately nowadays dr arora is doing but i always tell him you please drop this idea because uh, we got uh, too much funding from dvt but uh, we got growth promotion also in my in brassica but uh, oil is not good for health why because if oil is contaminated then ultimately whole research is waste why well size of nano particle is very small and it is it is good that there is some biotic or abiotic stress mechanism i don't know you people are from biotechnology and biochemistry you know well because i have never studied biochemistry and bio and biology because i have always been the student of mathematics what i what biology i have learned from you people so i don't know much but i don't know very clear uh, very clearly that uh, if we are investing biomaterial nano materials to plant okay plant will grow but uh, there must be a critical or cut off limit above which we cannot uh, administer such kind of you know uh, nano particles to plant so this is a way uh, to reconsider or to review the problem and to control the dose of you know nano materials to plant we what we do we entertain when we see there is a growth say 2 ppm is okay 3 ppm is okay 5 ppm 10 ppm 20 ppm good growth 90 ppm to good growth we say 100 150 now we are increasing and increasing the dose of nano material and uh, what we find that the ultimate growth was at uh, for example at 300 ppm we extracted the oil of 300 ppm result was negative oil was useful oil was useless so there is a need to investigate the phenomena in a very strategic manner let us suppose that we have invested we have invested uh, our uh, uh, for example uh, broth or you know a tissue culture media uh, with some 20 ppm of nano particle any and let us see that at 20 nanometer what is the oil yield and what is the quality of the oil this is that that is lacking actually the part uh, lacking in the part of our research so this that is why i cannot recommend too much if you are interested to uh, apply nano particles any kind of nano particles for particular interest in growth of plant then your, what mistake i have done i have shared with you you please do uh, this kind of you know approach periodically monitor that let us suppose that at 20 ppm dosage what is the yield and what quality of oil is produced for example So in this way, I I would like to suggest it because we have not in we have ultimately taken the target and finally we have killed the growth and then we isolated and result was negative. I think uh, I would like to add upon Dr. Jaydi in uh, nanotechnology nanoparticle research, particularly it is very much it is very much essential to have four parameter, right yeah. kind of the dose, right kind of the application, and right time of application. exactly exactly and the mode of application is also very very important mode of application yes. and uh, i suggest that uh, nano particle should not be used for just transportation purposes so that they accumulate my purpose is to trigger the machinery biological machinery.
machinery, yes. whether it is a transport machinery, whether it is metabolic machinery, so that the de novo, de novo machinery get triggered, then the quality of the produce will remain intact. Otherwise, yeah. certainly, certainly the problem is there. And that's why nanotechnology research has to require due attention with respect to more and more research and more and more trials so that you will be able to understand how nanotechnology works. Because until yeah. unless we are just taking just a empirical fashion, it will not grow. Anyway, yeah, I think, not I think uh, one more question is there. Uh, sir, uh, one more question is there. Uh, it is by uh, Rivati. Uh, uh, Lucerne crop can extract gold particles. What is the mechanism and its uptake? Sir, we are working on this aspect, but not uh, giving too much time because of some other activities. If we take uh, nanomembranes of uh, biopolymer, for example, chitosin or other kind of edible biopolymer, uh, we deposit such kind of membrane over grapes, over uh, you know strawberries, then we can preserve good uh, nanomembranes. Because uh, uh, if we if we if we if we think that uh, we administer some you are muted you are muted you are muted. For example, we observe that in the strawberry there is a fungus. We want to kill that fungus, and uh, for killing that, for the sake of killing that fungus, we. Uh, apply it some sort of carbon, some sort of nanotube. For example, carbon nanotube or some functional carbon nanotube. Fungus will be killed. But what about the persistence of the carbon nanomaterial or any kind of nanomaterial into our edible system? So this is a very serious issue, and uh, this again, uh, you know, involves uh, you know the concept of uh, you know regulation of uh, the dose of uh, carbon nanomaterial or any other type of because i we observed we are working on strawberries uh, with uh, one uh, scientist of uh, college of agriculture i have given them some uh, functional carbon nanotubes that carbon nanotubes we are well functioning on the some some sort of fungus i don't know uh, so they were very much happy that yes uh, dr zaidi you have given very good material fungus was okay it was cured but at the same time, uh, we are not sure that uh, how much uh, you know material became toxic. Particularly, the edible part of the material became toxic. That is question because we have uh, we have learned from past history that it is not wise to administer nanomaterial continuously to get good and good crop yield. And ultimately, the oil was oil was spoiled. So th that is why I am telling you. And Dr. Anil Gupta is what saying that is very good that uh, we should have to create uh, our, we should have to investigate our study in some planned manner rather than uh, uh, just uh, going and going and getting, that is not the good thing. Periodical monitoring is essential. So uh, uh, that material is actually showing toxicity. So uh, I would like to suggest we are thinking that some sort of, uh, you know, biopolymer, edible biopolymer, if it is transformed into the form of the liposomes, or maybe transformed into some micellar structure in nano in or some nano structure, and then we can apply 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 these kind of materials or edible products, particularly for for example fruits. Then we can get some good results. What I think. Okay, Daksha. Thank you. I think. Uh, sir, one more question is there uh, by Dr. Vishnu from MPKV Rahori. Uh, how nanoparticles are useful for enhancing the storage life of fruits and vegetables? He has answered. I think. He has answered only. Okay. Yeah, I, I think okay. the other other question was how plant extract like lucerne that could be utilized for green synthesis of gold nanoparticle. That was the question. Yes. That, that, is, is, that, is, that, is, that is a encyclopedic question because many people are extracting plants. Okay. And in plants, there is a tannin. Tannin is serving as a Reducing agent, so you take gold chloride and you add, yeah, yeah, yeah. And add some precipitating agent and heat up ultimately in C2 gold nanoparticles are prepared in plant extract because tannin is a reducing agent. So, bottom up approach, it is a bottom up approach of chemical reduction. Eh? Okay. Yeah, that is a very simple approach. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. I think uh, uh, sir, uh, one question yes. from uh, Mr. Akshay. Akshay, you can uh, ask your question. 
hello good afternoon sir sir i have a basic question that sir after synthesizing the nano particle using green synthesis method how to measure the concentration of that solution sir it can be measured via like aas or icp or any special yes. instrument is required to measure the concentration sir yes that is a very good question when you prepare the nano material or nano formulation simply you say nano for plant based nano formulation you subject uh, this nano formulation to digestion with some hard acid for example sulfuric acid or all that for example if there is a uh, there is uh, some iron nano particle into your uh, plant extract you digest it and ultimately you after digestion you you monitor the concentration or you quantify the concentration of iron through either atomic absorption spectroscopy or icpms that is a very simple thing Sir, uh, say uh, if we go for digestion, uh, if the property of these nanoparticles changes, sir? nothing. That there is not issue of nanoparticle here. You know, activity of nanoparticle is actually associated with your uh, plant extract. After okay. after that, you are simply interested in how much is the iron content in that. So, uh, okay, iron content, iron content is a chemical uh, is a chemical issue. It is a completely okay. it is the issue of the chemistry, particularly related to composition. Your interest is not to investigate the size. For example, you for example you prepare iron. For example, you prepare silver nanoparticles. Okay, so there may be some concentration of silver in there. So ultimately, you simply evaporate all the water and ultimately you investigate through ICP. For example, one microliter of silver colloid you have taken. You have operated silver colloid. You have operated water from one microliter. For example, you have taken there may be some nanogram level of the silver there, and you can't quantify this uh, silver with ICPMS through calibration. Okay, because ICPMS or uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy spectrometry doesn't give. Uh, there is no relation with nano. They actually simply evaluate your material content. okay sir uh, even i have synthesized the particles sir the problem what i have faced is that see when we use the precursor solution if we increase the concentration of that solution uh, the precipitation of the solution takes place sir under such circumstances the concentration of that uh, nano solution decreases right sir you know there is a key rule in preparation of nanomaterials in laboratory scale that you always use precursor in dilution if you increase the concentration of precursor you will always get a micro particles you take okay. dilute and dilute but what is the problem with you and us that if you take a, if you lead in dilution we will get low concentration we will get low yield matter is that yes. we will not get too much volume so but yeah. we will get we will get fine nano particles that is nano particles in finer size as well as in yeah. shape when we are using precursor in dilution Okay, sir. So Thank you so don't much. Don't increase the concentration. Otherwise, you will not get nano. You will get micro. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, precipitation that's means that's precipitation means there is there is something wrong. You are getting micro. Okay, sir. Nano Thank you so much. Nano will never precipitate. Nano will always be stable in the form of light. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and sharing your valuable knowledge with us. Uh, thank you. Now I invite Dr. Anil Kumar, Director of Education, sir, for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Manit Rana. Indeed, I am very happy to have our colleague, Dr. M. G. S. Jadhi, who is very hardcore nano polymer chemist, and I know his capability. He work alone and also in team, and always having very innovative idea. and those innovative idea tends to be really comes in the form of several patent and uh, these patents are having really a value for field application so i really thanks dr jadhi to be with us today in this national webinar now you know in whole day the basic purpose of this national webinar is really purposeful and uh, this i am happy that uh, what we are thinking we have achieved at least in first day the theme of the national webinar is nano size big impact nano revolution for transforming agriculture food nutrition and health and in this connection after the welcome address of dr prashant jambulkar 
I have just provided the background of this webinar. And uh, as I already told you, that nanotechnology has tremendous scope and application. And the nanotechnology contribute in many sectors, ranging from medicine, health, transportation, material, energy, agriculture, food safety, environmental science, information technology, and many more. And nanomedicine is actually the application of nanotechnology in medicine. And that's why we have deliberately kept health also into this webinar theme. So if you see that uh, when we are talking about uh, incremental uh, in the yield and the quality, then certainly there is a need of technological intervention. And uh, these technology intervention, whether it is a nanotechnology, whether it is a biotechnology, whether it is genomics, bioinformatics, or maybe at any other frontier sciences like disruptive sciences are appearing and many convergent technology and all those technology the advances have always been to a two-edged sword offering both upside and downside sometime even when technology has been used that is good it has had un, it has had also unexpected negative result and you know very well and if you are able to address the both thing together, and I, I always quote, any technology have to evaluate it by their impact onto the human health, impact onto the biodiversity, and impact on the environment. And if benefits are more compared to the risk, then technology could be accepted. So after this, uh, my background about this webinar, our uh, DDG crop science, Dr. T. R. Sarma, shared his vision and uh, he explained how self sufficiency in food production is achieved by the scientific contribution, by policy planning, and the hard efforts of the farming community. In his address, he asked scientific fraternity to cater the emerging challenges to Indian agriculture by bringing technology for enhancing the efficiency improving the quality and reducing the wastages. In this connect context, he suggested that nanotechnology provide immense opportunity if implemented intelligently. It contributes to sustainable agriculture by enhancing crop production and restoring and improving soil quality. He also mentioned that future nanotechnology research should also focus on mechanism of nanotoxicology and to achieve these goals, he asked young scientists to collaborate and come under one umbrella to work on a targeted approach to achieve the sustainable crop production. He suggested to organize young scientists conclave, targeting young scientists who has prestigious fellowship, such as Ramanujan Fellowship, Ramalinga Swami Fellowship, DST Inspire Fellowship, and many more fellowship that is being offered like DST Kothari and uh, many more fellowships from CSIR and DBT. And uh, if we are uh, organizing conclave for such kind of young scientists, then they have very brilliant idea. And uh, those brilliant idea have to implement it in every walk of life. And uh, as I already told you, with, whether it is agriculture, it's in veterinary or medical sciences, everywhere there is a need of innovative idea. And those innovative idea can drive the innovations in such a manner that we are able to develop the potential technology for solving the problem of agriculture. After the inaugural address of the DDG Crop Science, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Arvind Kumar, emphasized on the use of nanotechnology-based nano herbicide and nano fertilizer. He mentioned the use of nano urea and uh, rice bran based nano silica for various applications. And you know very well that uh, rice bran is having a lot of silicate content. And those silicate content, if you can convert into nano silica particle, and those nano silica particle is really having value for coping various biotic and abiotic stresses. And henceforth, we cannot undermine the use of agro based for its utilization if we are using it judicious, judiciously for uh, applying the tools and technology of uh, nanoscience. He also emphasized 
throughout the nano mission of the government of india and the focus of this mission in various field including health and agriculture lastly he said nano particle based biosensor have been used in several disease diagnosis including cancer as well as many of the important agriculturally important plant diseases after the uh, presidential address of professor arvind kumar vice chancellor rlbcu i have spoken about the need of one health concept in uh, our system where we have to coordinate with not only agriculture science there must be a interface between agriculture sciences plant sciences medical sciences and veterinary sciences so that we can able to develop okay, some of the thoughts and idea and those convergent technology which are evolved through interdisciplinary okay, efforts that, that could be utilized for that could be utilized for solving the one health initiative and you know very well that good health can only be achieved by nutritionally balanced and healthy diet and uh, you know men public uh, men mainly relies on different kind of the sources of the food whether it is from plant whether it is from uh, vegetarian source or maybe non vegetarian source like uh, fish meat animals etc etc and uh, in order to go provide good nutritional profile for human consumption we have to strengthen the integrated nutrient management and integrated nutrient management where we have to see that plant health has to be ensured plant our plant health can only be ensured if our soil fertility is there soil nutrient profile is good so in order to maintain the soil health and subsequently the human health there is in between there is health of the uh, fishes aquatic organism then uh, also the cattle also the um uh, other bell, other uh, chain in the uh, other uh, food chain where we have to strengthen our efforts that that nutritional profile of, of these different food sources has to be strengthened so that we are able to attain good nutritional profile of the human and ultimately we can able to avoid several uh, onset of the several diseases and risk associated with the nutritional uh, deficiency and after this uh, discussion we have already given a uh, lot of uh, impact of the nanotechnology for uh, achieving the uh, green blue white and yellow revolution and this revolution can only be possible through integrated nutrient management where the role of nanotechnology could not be undermined and after the uh, uh, my presentation dr ramesh relia who has spoken on nano fertilizer for sustainable and precision agriculture he emphasized and on efforts to minimize the impact of unused fertilizer you know very well that only 30% fertilizer have been utilized remaining it has to go to the either uh, it is leased to the uh, ground water or it is volatilized or it is wasted so in order to avoid uh, such kind of the impact of this unutilized fertilizer we have to have regulation and policy level regulation and also the technological intervention by doing research and development in the in the field of coating of the fertilizer like neem coated urea now neem coated urea is providing many fold advantages to the farmers community and similarly other coating so that this coating of the fertilizer can have sustained and slow release of the fertilizer and uh, it will be working for longer run and plant will be benefited long and also the mixing of multi nutrient enabling them to dissolve co fertigation co fertigation where you have to see how bio inoculant and uh, nano nutrient together they can work and able to maintain the uh, nutrient a uh, a profile of these uh, different microorganisms and uh, we are, we are also having he also emphasized on the use of nano fertilizer for precision and sustainable agriculture as nano fertilizer have more surface area compared to the volume he summarized his presentation by emphasizing the characteristics of nano fertilizer 
having targeted delivery, controlled release, micro volume to address the challenges of eutrophication, complement with the vision of United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. He reiterated to make university collaboration for similar kind of the research work. He, his idea and experience on nano fertilizer will definitely help us to address the global problem of fertilizer pollution and to design the strategy to augment the nutrient use efficiency by plants in a better way. And after the uh, forenoon session, we have a lunch break and followed the, by the lunch break, we have very imminent presentation by Dr. M. G. Jadi. And I think you can see his uh, depth of knowledge in the field of polymer chemistry. And uh, Dr. Jadi briefed about the milestone achieved in the area of nanoscience technology. He mentioned the unique feature of carbon nanotube and graphene. And although the word nanotechnology is new, but the phenomena of nano technology is old and already exists in nature and uh, you know how he has given the uh, shown the slide we are beautiful nature in the form of mollusk or cell or maybe rudraksh or maybe other other uh, uh, plants which are uh, giving beauty to the nature different color of the plant different uh, color flavor fragrance and all these are basically, if you see, they are driving by the synthesis process. And this is again uh, a synthesis anabolic process that is taking place. And those anabolic process, again, a kind of nanotechnology, which we have yet to visualize. So this is the basically the concept. And uh, later on, he has uh, given in his uh, talk about the use of waste, different kind of the waste whether it is a agro waste, whether it is a waste derived from the tire industry, whether waste from the uh, wooden industry, and how those waste could be utilized. Even parali, you know, parali, I think that is a major problem. And this parali could be also utilized. So see how innovative idea he is having to convert this agro waste into wealth. And uh, I am sure that under your leadership, Dr. Jadi, the things will further move upon. And uh, he also quoted a famous line of Alberto Giacometti, failure is my friend. If I succeed, it would be like dying. Maybe worse. So the budding scientists can learn from these lines that we should take challenges without taking care of the failure. So I think uh, I am I'm also pretty sure that while we are young, we are all, always having sense of insecurity. And uh, this sense of insecurity always been problematic until unless you will not overcome why the failure, you will not succeed. So this is basically the learning you have given to our participant, learned participant. And now I think uh, the uh, final concluding remark from my side, I think uh, uh, my uh, colleague really helped particularly Manit Rana, to document what to conclude. Finally, the contemporary glorious future of nanotechnology got a dynamic push with the invention of a scanning tunneling tunnel microscope by Jared Winning and Hinnert Reuter, Nobel Prize in Physics. Thereafter, many breakthrough research came up and many of those were received the highest prizes, such as Nobel Prize in Chemistry for year 1996. It was given to Professor Robert F. Carl, Harold W. Caroto, and Richard E. Smelly for discovery of the fluorines. And in the year 2010, uh, Andrew James and Constantin were jointly awarded the uh, 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics for their groundbreaking experiment regarding the two dimensional material graphene. And in the year 2016, Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to Stuttgart uh, for showing that their nano school machine could lead to improved drug delivery, improved microelectronics, and improved control of nano scale matter. And I think uh, mostly in this webinar, we have uh, participants from 20 different states and more than 100, and they are belonging to mainly from uh, universities and also the ICR institution and also from other places. And uh, I am pretty sure that uh, the participant 
who are attending this particular seminar this, this is just beginning in agriculture university we always rely on the application side rather than we are going for hard core science but we are again emphasizing without hard core science we are not able to achieve the application till we are understanding the mechanic whether chemical mechanic whether physical mechanic or the biological mechanic all the interdisciplinary knowledge has to be required while we are pursuing this nanotechnology research in the agriculture university or icr agriculture institution i am sure that today's three lecture or the uh, inaugural address by the ddg crop science will be benefiting all of you and i am sure that tomorrow uh, session will be also highly beneficial because again we have four speaker they have again different background so my purpose was that under this platform we have to have cutting across the discipline and uh, then now expert from these cutting across discipline they can share their wide knowledge so that people can understand how the sing how the tools and technology tools and techniques of the nanotechnology that will be applicable to every walk of life and uh, this is the last i am thanking you to all the speaker and all the participant for their presence in this national webinar thank you thank you so much sir for your concluding remarks now i request dr piyush for vote thank you dr rana so we are winding up this uh, session today before winding up i i would like to express my sincere thanks to all the dignitaries distinguished guests for this uh, webinar i express my thanks to respected vice chancellor dr ravin kumar director uh, igfri uh, dr ramesh chandra director education dr anil kumar and all the dear participants on behalf of rlb ceu and icr igfri i feel immense pleasure to extend a vote of thanks to dr ramesh ahilya ji and dr mg ajari sir to share his valuable to share some his valuable time and sharing his knowledge and thoughts with us thank you so much sir for your kind presence and source of motivation thank you very much sir so there is an announcement for tomorrow so we request all the participants to join uh, tomorrow session it will be start on uh, at 10:30 am i request all the participants to join 15 minutes earlier okay same, see you tomorrow thanks same thanks, link thanks will be again. followed sir same link same zoom link same link okay. okay so the the link is same for uh, say, tomorrow session thank you dr rana and dr prashant jamulkar pius babile and uh, other team yes, member dr jogesh for nicely conducting or organizing this this thank you, and thanks to tanuj uh, also so uh, the all the efforts which he has made to bring out the uh, program very smoothly tanuj and shailesh thank you we'll meet tomorrow Thank you. Thank you so